Today is the April 25th, 2022 regular meeting for the Board of Water Supply, or BWS. I am Board Chair Brian Andaya. And before we begin, I would like to go over some virtual meeting regulations required by law. Board members attending any board meeting remotely must be visible to the public to be considered present and meet quorum guidelines. Board members participating remotely must also disclose their location and anyone present at their location during roll call. Further, all emergency orders and proclamations related to COVID-19 have expired. The public is now allowed to attend the Board of Water Supply board meetings here on Baratania Street at our BWS Public Service Building located at 630 South Baratania Street in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, masks are not required to be worn. Uh, we do have a waiting area in our lobby downstairs. And if uh, anyone is here to testify, uh, they will be brought up um, one by one into the boardroom here. I'd like to take a moment uh, to take roll call of board members who are present. Please say I when I call your name, along with the appropriate disclosures. Vice Chair Kapua Sproke. I, I am working remotely from my home office and I am alone with the door closed. Thank you. Board member Ray Soon. I think he's uh, on his way up. Board member Max Sort. I'm uh, remotely at my home office uh, and I share with my wife. So she's my right on the other desk. Working. Working. <laughs> um, board member Jade Butai. I, uh, I'm alone at my office and I'm, you know, with the door closed. And board member Don Sepchek. I present in the boardroom. Thank you, Don. Um, board so member here. Anthony. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, board member Nalehu Anthony. Hey, aloha. Good afternoon. I and I'm in my home office at home uh, with no one else here. Aloha. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. Uh -huh. Chair recognizes um, board member uh, Max Ward, who is joining us here in our boardroom. Uh, Ray Ray Soon. Soon. I'm sorry, <laughs> Max is up there. <laughs> Ray Soon, who is, um, has, has joined us here in our boardroom. Yeah, he's better looking than me anyway, so don't <laughs> say that. I just have more hair. In person <laughs> is always better. Um, all right, so board members who are calling or video conferencing in, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. If you should have a question or comment or wish to enter a motion, or second a motion on an action item, um, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself before continuing to speak. Also in the room with us here, our manager, Ernie, Ernest Lau, and board secretary, Joy Cruz Ashin. Uh, joining on WebEx to monitor public testimony is Mr. Stephen Nordstrom, Information Specialist 2 from our Communications Office. And also joining us by WebEx are attorneys Jeff Lau and Jessica Wong, both from the City and County Corporation Council Department. Another reminder for those of you who are participating remotely, please mute your microphone if you haven't already, and only unmute if you intend to speak. If you encounter technical issues during today's meeting, please use the WebEx chat to send a direct message to our support team. Your names are listed in a message to all WebEx participants. To open a chat window, please click or tap on the text bubble icon on the right side of the WebEx toolbar. Mahalo. Before beginning today's regular board meeting, I would like to state that this board is dedicated to providing safe, dependable, and affordable supply of water now and into the future. Uh, testimony was accepted uh, via email and fax. Written testimony will be posted to the BWS website at boardofwatersupply.com. 
online testimony was also accepted at our, our website at boardofwatersupply.com slash testimony. We are presently uh, uh, accepting telephone testimony to any uh, individual who would like to testify at today's meeting. Uh, the number to call is 808-748-6040. Once again, that number to call is 808-748-6040. Callers will be placed in the queue and brought up to testify one at a time. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in-person testimony is being accepted as well uh, during this meeting from the lobby of our Board of Water Supply Public Service Building located at 630 South Veracanya Street. Those wishing to, test, to provide testimony in person will be placed in the queue and brought up to testify one at a time. All right, uh, materials available for the meeting are accessible at www.boardofwatersupply.com. That's spelled out, all spelled out, um, one word, slash board meetings. Again, www.boardofwatersupply, one word, all small cat, all, all small uh, case, dot com slash board meetings. This meeting is also viewable via live streaming on the BWS website at www.boardofwatersupply.com slash live. The video player will appear on your screen. You may have to click the arrow on video to start it. You also may have to unmute the audio as muted audio tends to be the default setting. Uh, today, I'd like to take um, the agenda items um, out of order. Uh, members, uh, if you have any objections, uh, please let me know. Uh, it's my intention to um, move to the top of the agenda today. Um, item number one for information. This is the update on the Board of Water Supply's response to the potential impacts of the Red Hill fuel contamination. All right, Manager Lau. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I just uh, also have uh, with me and to assist in the uh, presentation of the update is Mr. Uh, Barry Usagawa, head of our Water Resources Division. Ms. Uh, uh, Kathleen Elliott Pahinui, our Information Officer, head of our Communications Office, and Mr. Erwin Kawata, head of our uh, Water Quality Division. Uh, just to start off with, uh, you know, we just want to thank the board and the community. Uh, we have a um, our request for voluntary conservation, a uh, reduction of 10% uh, voluntarily from our community, especially those living in the Honolulu water system, the Aia Halawa system. Uh, we can share a little bit more about our efforts to do the outreach during Kathleen's presentation. Um, I just want to also acknowledge that the, uh, uh, you know, we are happy that the, uh, the the Department of Justice and U.S. Navy decided to withdraw their uh, appeal of the uh, State Department of Health emergency order uh, that was issued, uh, finalized in January of this year. Uh, that appeal in state court was withdrawn. Um, so we were very glad with that. And also to let you know that the, uh, the, the U.S. Navy has also uh, withdrawn their re request for a uh, uh, underground storage tank permit uh, from the Department of Health. Uh, so uh, we understand that uh, the Department of Health is considering a, a modification or a revision to the emergency order that they issued earlier this year. Uh, we haven't actually see, had a chance to see a copy of that a draft or that order yet, uh, but we'll be sure to share with the board members as soon as we receive it. At, at this time, I just want to uh, have Barry Usagawa, head of our Water Resources Division, uh, joining me at the presentation, uh, provide an update on the uh, water shortage uh, uh, plan. Okay, go ahead, Barry. Thank you, Ernie, and uh, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this is an update to the last one that we did last month in March. Next slide, please. Yeah, because so due to the Red Hill um, fuel release and subsequent shutdown of uh, three major sources, 
uh, halava shaft, IAL wells, and halava wells. It's, we anticipate a, a water shortage condition uh, this summer uh, in the IAL, halava, and Honolulu water systems. They're two separate systems. Um, and until those sources are either put back on in service or replacement wells are um, in operation, we expect to see this every summer for the next several years. Um, what I um, had walked through last uh, board meeting was this uh, water shortage plan um, that we um, put together. Uh, it provides a strategic and tactical steps to assess, declare, and control water demand. So going clockwise from 12 o'clock, once we're notified of the water shortage, we um, activated our incident-specific response procedures. The initial response was to um, compensatory pump operations. We uh, shifted our pumpage to other available sources, and I'll get into that um, in more detail. My staff assessed the remaining source capacities to meet the max day demand because we're meeting the demands now. But in summer, when they increase to max day is when we're going to start to see some potential issues in those systems. Um, and then the sequential phases, a declaration of water shortage condition, uh, which we anticipate we will be. Um, uh, but we continue to monitor pumpage, uh, chloride, and rainfall trends, head levels, um, some in, on a weekly basis. Uh, if uh, the, and we already talked about a 10% voluntary water conservation, and if that's successful, we, we would be good. If, we're, if, they, if the response is not there, then we have the authority to ramp up to mandatory conservation and even development moratoriums. Um, if the if the solution lasts um, several years, um, we went through last time the CIP projects that we uh, identified, and uh, you will see a number of um, additional projects in the fiscal year 2023 CIP uh, to compensate. And then, the lastly, is important to recover a recovery period after the water shortage condition is, is over so our aquifers can uh, uh, you know, fill up again. So that's the sequential phasing. Next. So in March, well, I guess in April, this is the April Hawaii drought monitor. It's gotten worse than March. Um, we're now in, um, in for Oahu, uh, the leeward side is, has advanced to severe drought, D2. Um, then as you move east, D1 moderate drought uh, in windward is abnormally dry, D0. Uh, we anticipate this getting worse during the summer. That is the forecast from the National Weather Service um, that we'll start to get into uh, a dry uh, summer and fall. Next. So, um, you know, of course, there is a strong correlation between how much we produce and how much rainfall there is. In the, in the top graph, you can see our rainfalls have been dropping. Um, in December, we had 276% on normal. That's what the red line is. Um, so anything above that is above normal. Below that is below normal, of course. Um, in February and March, you know, 51 and Sorry, I kind of read that. 46% of normal. Uh, the National Weather, uh, Weather Service has reported that this was a very dry winter, except for December. They're making comparisons to the six year drought in, well, anyway, the drought in 2000 when we had a dry winter. They're not saying that it will be, it'll last that long, but um, we normally re require or we rely on our winter rains to recharge our aquifers ahead of the next summer high demand season. When we get a dry winter, we're starting the summer with um, water levels that are a little bit lower. Um, in um, March, the, the bottom graph in uh, March 20, uh, in, well, in March, production was 135 million gallons per day. This is island wide. Um, it's about six million gallons over the five year monthly average, which is the gray line since about well, 14 MGD 
greater than what we experienced in demand last March 2021. Um, so what this uh, means is that we're having to draw aquifer storage uh, now that we would be expecting to have during the summer. So we just de decreasing our storage going into summer. It's happened before. Um, the head levels are generally high, but um, you know, this is a special situation. And I did point out the last time that the main difference between the winter and summer demand, which is about 20 million gallons per day, is really outdoor water use. You know, we have the same amount of people, but the days are longer, it's hotter, people are irrigating. Um, so, uh, and uh, sorry, primarily irrigating. And that is one area that in a water shortage we'd be focusing on to reduce because obviously they can get by in a winter with less irrigation. Um, but it is the perfect drought scenario because now we have uh, a dry forecast, a dry winter, uh, Red Hill shut down, and we have two major pumping stations that are still in, in repair. I'll get into that next. And by the way, you can ask me questions at any time, if you like. <clears throat> the um, compensatory, compensatory operational adjustments from the shutdown, and as Ernie said previously, you know, Halawa Shefford presents 20% of the Honolulu water system. Aya Halawa is actually 50%. So it's you know, very thin in Aya and Halawa water system. Um, so we anticipate new wells. We are going to be drilling them. I think Erin's Ar going to talk about that later. But we expect that to take between five to seven years. Uh, that has been our historical experience. And, you know, we're trying to accelerate that as much as we can. Um, but that is a typical time frame. Um, so during that period or until the sources can be turned back on, and they need, we need to be very confident that it's not going to pull fuel into the sources because we know what can happen. The consequence is, is tremendous. Um, but the operational adjustments is that available pump run times are increased. Our standby pumps typically reserved for pump equipment failures have to be turned on um, as demand increases through the day. And I guess going into summer, it'll be turned on more. A pump which makes seed statement state permitted use on a 12 month moving average. Um, and chlorides um, are monitored to ensure levels don't in, do not rise significantly. But if chlorides rise, pumpage has got to have, it has to be decreased. And that's what happened at Garatania Station, and I'll show you that. Um, and the pumpage then is tried to, we try to spread it with, out through the remaining sources, but at some point you kind of run out of sources, yeah. Uh, we are transferring water from adjacent systems. So right now we're pulling about a million gallons from uh, the YPO, YPO systems into town, about a million from Pearl City. We have some improvements that's going to help us increase that transfer from Pearl, Pearl City into town and into Aya Halava. Uh, but those will take uh, a number of more years, less than a new well. Uh, but what that does is it decreases available pump capacities from those systems. And then the pump capacities from the affected systems basically become substandard. Our standard is operating run times uh, at 16 hours per day to meet max day demands. Um, we anticipate those pumps being run greater than 20 hours, in, in some cases closer to 22 or more. Next. So, um, excuse me, and I'm blocking my view. Um, so this is the Nuwanu Aquifer. Um, this is, we have three sources here. Uh, and the total permitted use is the blue line, 14.8. Um, and the, the red line is the total of the, of the pumpages of those three. And you can see that it exceeds the permitted use um, 
and because we had to shift pumpage to Baritania, but now that we have reduced Baritania um, because of rising chlorides, we expect the 12 month moving average to start dropping. Uh, but that'll take a, a couple of months um, because of averaging. Um, and we cut back from Baritania and the chlorides actually we, uh, did decrease. So, um, you know, that was, that was uh, good to see. Next. So we shifted some of the pumpage to Kamaki Station and that increased the uh, Oman moving average, the red dots went above the blue line um, because we had to cut back at Baritania. Um, the chlorides are not an issue at, uh, at Kaimaki, but the heads are starting to drop earlier in the season. And I'll get, in that, get into that in the groundwater report. Um, but with the repairs of Kali Station and Kalawal, pumpage will be reduced at Kaimaki. So we have a means to, the, to, to bring that back down. But again, it'll take a couple of months because of averaging. Next. These are the heads. So you can see Kaimaki has dropped into the alert level of 21.72 feet because we're pumping more to compensate for the cutback of and Halava and, I mean, in Baratania too. Um, but Baratania and Kalihi index stations, so the head levels or water levels remain high. Um, again, once we get to the repairs of Kalihi and Kalawal, um, the pumpage will be reduced at Kaimuki and levels are expected to respond. So they'll start to go up a little bit. Um, all other South Oahu index wells and the 12 month moving average pumpages are within acceptable levels. So these are the, 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 the worst ones. Next. Um, you may have seen this before. This is just uh, what happened at Baritania. We increased pumpage to make up for halava and then chloride started rising. This is a little service, the next one shows the chlorides um, rising even further. Uh, next slide. Uh, but we reduced the pumpage and the chlorides dropped down um, to about 150 or so million gallons um, per parts per million chloride. So it responded. But that's um, that tells me that uh, Baritania is now chloride sensitive and we cannot hit it really hard until it fully recovers and that may take uh, you know, a number of uh, wet years to get the aquifer back uh, to previous levels. Next. This slide is very busy, hard to see, but this is all chlorides. Uh, showing you how we uh, monitor chlorides on a, uh, a monthly basis. Um, can you click it one more time, please? And this red line then is uh, 160 ppm target level that we want to keep our sources below. Um, the secondary standard is 250 parts per million, but we, we try to self-manage and keep it uh, below that. Um, some people can taste the difference. The only well that's above that is Manana. Manana is always a little bit on the high side, but it's blended before it reaches the first service. These peaks on the right are in gray and brown. That, that's the Baritania ones I just showed you. But um, just to tell you, show you that we are monitoring chlorides on a continuous basis for the Honolulu system. Next. And so there's two uh, causes of water shortage. In our rules, uh, it's low groundwater. So when we get a drought and then when three or more index wells fall below, uh, into alert or critical or chlorides rise for three consecutive months, it's sufficient sources to hamper operations. We can declare a water shortage condition based on low groundwater. But um, the framework that we presented last month um, is also can be due to the degradation of water quality as in Red Hill or extended disruptions to water system delivery infrastructure. Next. And so we we um, we presented uh, these water shortage condition triggers last month. Uh, no water shortage is pump all available pumps uh, are pumping sixteen hours to meet max day. In alert, 
um, they're meeting the Q95 max day in 20 hours. I'll explain that later. In an alert, uh, the pumps are running 22 hours per day. And we only got 24 hours in a day. So the margin becomes very thin. And that's why um, you know, we identified that level as being critical. Um, so the Q95 actually is the 95th percentile of a daily pumpage uh, daily pumpages. So there are peaks, but uh, maybe if you go to the next slide. So this is Honolulu um, water system. Uh, this is on our website. We update it weekly. Um, and so the historical max day, Q95 max day is 74 million gallons per day. Now daily goes higher than that. The peaks, the amplitudes go a little bit higher. Um, but we selected Q95 because, um, you know, the, the, it, it smooths it out. But it, what it does is it, we're assuming that there's between five to 10% conservation to flatten those peaks down below this amount. So currently, without our sources online, we can barely, in fact, we, we cannot meet that demand in Honolulu. Um, even when our pumps are running 24 hours a day. But by June, we expect them to be online and that will increase our, our ability to meet higher demands. But you can see in the summer months, they go up in the winter, they go down. So I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, next. Sorry, I have a quick question about this, about the last slide. Is it okay for me to ask now? You mentioned yeah, that um, by June, you expected to have the sources online. Are you meaning Kalihi and Kalawao? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and when we do bring them online, we'll, we'll be able to, well, and it's a partial by June, we'll be able to meet like 70, 78. So above, as long as we get enough pumping capacity to, to meet the max day, right? Over above 74. In Ayahalava, we're in um, harder shape because this is 50% or even more that we're cut back, um, shut down. Um, so you can see even the weekly averages exceed four. Uh, four is the max day at Q95 again, but this is also where our capacity lies right now. So if you go over four, what happens then, there's potential uh, low water pressures in the upper elevations, um, potential water shortages in certain days when, we, when the reservoir levels drop, we bottom out when we cannot keep up. So this is in a, a more of a critical stage. Um, so just wanted to show that. Next. Barry. On all of the charts that are one day pumpage numbers, are those that day or are they, are because of how you measure, are they like one week old or is it is it on time measurements? There's a lag. Uh, these are weekly, if you can go back, Joy. These are weekly uh, reports. So I believe on Thursday is when we uh, tally up the, the weekly uh, and we average it for a week and then we put it in there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But maybe Ray, uh, to your point, your, is that the question about on a particular day, the demand may be actually a little higher than- No, I'm really trying to, I, I guess I want to get to a point of, we have been asking the public to conserve. Right. And I want to know when we went out to ask the public to conserve and was there a measurable impact? Yeah, it was on March 10th. Oh. When we issued that request. Okay. Okay. So if you look at the scale. So it is March 11, March 18th. I mean, yeah, we, uh, you know, there, there's some decline and then it kind of came back. It, it's also driven by rainfall. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, which is yeah. uh, kind of a big okay. driver. Thank you. Right. But it's, it's you know, a good half a million below the, the red line. So, you know, we're, in, we're still in, in, in okay shape. But it's only April. Okay, next. So one of the things is we looked at existing uh, 
water use, but we also have to factor in new upcoming development projects. And this is our best estimate and is subject to change. And what we did was our customer care uh, division looked up all the permits that work with DPP, Department of Planning and Permitting. Of all the permits that were um, approved, and so that's under construction or will be in the construction, uh, permits that we are currently, or they are currently reviewing, not approved yet, but submitted. And the approved construction plans that, um, you know, from larger meters and stuff, 392, 3,929 of these permits. And when we average up the demands to two and a half MGD, um, and then there's proposed projects within the three to five year time frame. the 12 of them, this is in the Honolulu water system, 0.8 MGD and projects beyond five years are more, 2.1. 2 and beyond five years is you know, anybody's guess. It could be a year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. You know, it just depends. There's a lot of factors um, and unknowns and uncertainty around trying to estimate uh, proposed demand from permitting, but they total 5.4. If you max day that, which is one and a half, and it's actually max day is actually 1.2 in town, but it comes out to eight. Um, and that, you know, so, um, well, I'll, I'll go through IAF, same thing, um, three to five, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.024, so smaller system, right? Uh, total 1 million, 0 1.04. If you add the beyond five years, if you max day that, which is times one and a half, be a one and a half. Those would exceed, the capacities in a, a lava water system. Honolulu would be operating at the end, edge, like, um, you know, with, with over the next years when we um, complete those repairs fully, um, you know, it'd be right at that edge. So whether or not we actually see this, um, our historical experience is that for at least for Honolulu, there's still water conservation that's um, driving that increase in demand down. So it's it's not rising, but there's a limit to that. Um, whether or not, you know, the, these projections have not been validated by my staff. They're provided by the developers themselves. Uh, there's a tendency to bank water and, and ask for more. The timing may be off, the economy, in rising inflation, rising, you know, all these factors, right? Gas prices and stuff, material shortages, perhaps, you know, could affect that timing. But we wanted to throw this out there just so that, you know, that's a layer that's important to consider um, when we start talking about, oh, do we have enough capacity? If, if I could add to this, uh, again, to stress, this is a kind of a point in time estimate. So we know that over time, over the it, uh, this could change, and we're going to try to keep this as up to date as possible. But it's our, at this point, our best estimates working with DPP, working with the state, uh, getting feedback from large developers on their timing for their projects, and trying to estimate what is the potential water, the new water demand coming down the pipe um, in these two systems. But you guys, those numbers don't make sense. 3,929 results in 2.5 average demand and 25 will only result in 2.1 it really depends on the size of the project so this includes small permits and large permits all, all permits so almost 4,000 permits in the system and then looking at the total water demand uh potentially added and this is what we come up with so the 25 projects that are uh, larger water demand are probably your bigger projects that are coming down. So you got to find a way to explain that better to us. Uh, oh. Yeah. Well, we have been broken okay. down by residential, uh, single family, multifamily. Yeah, we, have a, we were finding a yeah. breakdown. Um, that yeah. would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Just did it. That, did it. yeah. yeah. yeah br breaking it out, I think it would be, we, you get a more accurate uh, uh, prognosis. Yeah, we can provide that. Uh, just keep in mind, we can we can break it down. The total will be still the number ultimately total will be the same, but 
Uh, we'll, we can provide that at the next board meeting. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Next. So this is the update on the repairs of those two major pumping stations. So we have eight major pumping stations for the Honolulu water system. And we are taking these two pumps off for repairs because this is prior to us finding out we had to shut down Halaba Shaft. Uh, so now we are prioritizing those repairs. And, and uh, so the status is that the pumps are being flushed now and tested for safe drinking water compliance. So the pumps have been replaced, they're pumping water. It just got to pass the water quality and compliance, and then we can put it into the system. We anticipate that happening by June. So right before summer, uh, Kali Station would just be the low service pumps. We still have to work on the high service. That's going to take another, you know, into next year. Um, but we'll be able to pump the full uh, permitted use of Kali. And in Kalawao, two of the three by June. So we'll have five or six pumps in operation there. And so with these pumps online, we expect the Honolulu water system pumps to be operating 20 hours per day to meet max day. And that would that would result in an alert condition, not a critical. So next. So when we slot, when we assess the water shortage condition with the framework, the trigger framework, um, Again, we, we anticipate with those repairs, Honolulu water system will be able to meet 74, the max day demand in 20 hours. And in an alert condition, it's still voluntary conservation, targeted seasonal mes messaging. <clears throat> We've put out 600 letters to the largest water users We're requesting a 10% water use reduction and retargeting outdoor use. But in Ayahalava, we anticipate pumps will be in excess of 22 hours per day. And we have one standby in case one of the pumps fails. Um, but this is very close to not being able to, being very close to our capacity limit. So in progressively restrictive order, uh, the voluntary is in place. We could increase that to mandatory and very targeted water use reductions. Um, if that doesn't work, we can go into water allotments and our rules stipulate how you create that. For those that non, are non-compliant, we can put in flow restrictors in their meters and we can increase rates. Um, if the, the repairs or the solution extend more than two years, then we'd be recommending a moratorium because once it, 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 the, the thought process behind this is if we approve your building permit today, you're going to start to, um, you know, the design is complete. You, you'll be starting to construct, and then the and then the um, occup, you know, occupying the building. That construction and occup, occupying probably take about two years. Um, so we need to curtail that if if we anticipate that exceeding our our capacity. So next, I have a question about that slide. Yeah. Um, so, but this is even for alert, we're assuming 20 hours per day and critical is at 22, right? Um, best practices is pumping at 16 hours per day. And so I'm just wondering and looking at the amount of time it's going to take us. I mean, thank goodness and mahalo to you and all the staff that's been working so hard to get Kalawa and Kalihi back online. Um, but have we pumped at 20 or 22 hours a day for a sustained period? Because we're looking at years before we're going to get new source back online. I guess I'm just worried about thinning of the lenses, rising chlorides, up coning, um, damage to our potential source if we continue at this rate at 20 or 22 hours over a sustained period. Yeah, thanks for that. It's during the summer max day period. So it's about three, four, five months. This assumes that in a winter we'll be backing down. Um, and if there's rainfall, then it's recharging, you know. But if we're in extended multi-year droughts and they don't get okay. recharged, then that becomes another issue. But we don't know that. We don't have a there's no extended multi-year forecast, but it's only okay. in the summer. Well, I guess the idea is to cut back in the winter. Um, so you know, that's sort of the idea. 
No, I, I understand the idea. I guess my concern is that March, April, we're already at 20 hours a day, right? Yeah. Or 22. And so I'm just, you know, looking out, have we pumped um, at 20 or 22 hours for four to six months before for these sources? That's my question. I believe in the history of these sources, the answer is yes. Um, but, but you know, rainfall is very different today than it was before, too. Right. We didn't have, you know, a lot of a shaft off uh, right. during the summer. So, um, you know, redistributing, um, you know, we're going to have to be relying on conservation to reduce that demand so that we don't over pump. But, right. I, I, you know, those are the monitoring um, uh, points that I presented previously. It's permitted use, head, rainfall, pumpage um, against capacity and against, uh, and, and, you know, so we certainly we don't want to salt up the aquifer or lose any sources from over pumping. That would, you know, our rules allow us to cut demand before that happens. So. Okay. So, so Kapoor, I think to your point, this is Ernie. Yes, uh, this will require basically continuous monitoring of the situation uh, because uh, this is uh, just at this moment. This is what it looks like. Uh, we need to monitor weather. Weather is really the big unknown too, uh, and that uh, correlates to uh, higher water demand if it's hotter and drier. So this will Great. require us to keep on looking at this as so we journey forward here. Okay, so thanks for that, Ernie and and um, and Barry. I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding what the plan is on a going forward basis, especially given kind of where we are already and concerns with Baratania and um, and other sources. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have a few uh, questions as well, and I just um, uh, wanna. Um, I understand there's a lot of variables, weather and and everything else. I just want a better understanding on how to read these uh, graphs. So um, looking at the current slide, which is um, on screen, assess water storage condition and water conservation responses. So it says here that the Honolulu water system is on alert status and the max day demand is 74. So if you go back two slides up to the graphs or more than two slides. The weekly pumping, you know, January 2021 20, to the present. The 74 MGD is that red line. Correct. Right. Okay, and fortunately enough, um, as of uh, the most current reading, April 15th, we're, we're below. We're below, we're about um, 60 MGD. Or a little below 60 MGD. 50, yes. 58 maybe. Uh, okay, 58 MGD. So we, okay, so, okay, I'm yeah. reading that right. And then for IAEA, um, we're about uh, 3.1 3. 3. or so right now. 3.1 right now. Right, right edge of the graph. And then um, the max is 4. MGD, okay. Right. Um, and the reason why IAEA is deemed critical as opposed to alert is because uh, to get the four MGD, we have to pump 22 hours as opposed to 20. Is that the? 22 or more, yeah. Yeah. But well, we anticipate that happening in the summer. It's not happening yet. But the historical last year, it, it, it reached four. And, and if you look further back, it has also done that too. And to get to four, we have to do 22 hours. We have to pump 22 hours to get to that yeah. four. With the uh, remaining wells. With the yeah, remaining there's only, Right, there's, there's only three I, uh, wells. The BL right wells and Palava wells are shut down right now that supply the system. Okay. So, so is this the current situation is, or is this the situation with um, IA and Halava wells? Uh, this graph relates to the IA Halava system, water system and our Honolulu situation. Barry, can you go back to your rainfall graph uh, slide, uh, enjoy the rainfall slide? 
Uh, so I, I think to uh, Kapoor's question, uh, we'll wait until we get to that slide. Uh, hold on. One more. A uh, couple more. <laughs> yes. A little bit more. Right there. Uh, if you look on the, you see the uh, red line on the top upper left, uh, Honolulu watershed intake, rain, rainfall intake. The red line is normal rainfall. So uh, February and March was way below normal, like about half or less. Then if you look on the monthly production, uh, the blue line is actually 2021 calendar year um, numbers on, on um, how much production had to be done to meet the water demand. Mm -hmm. The gray boxes, the gray squares are the five year monthly average. Mm -hmm. The green line is actually 2022 numbers. So I think I think Papua saw this that if you look at where we are right now in terms of 135.29 is the March monthly average currently compared to where it was last year, which is the blue line with the triangles, which is about 14 MGD less at the same time of the year. So we're actually starting at a much higher place this year right now. And if you just kind of project it out where we might go for the summer, if it continues, we might go above the blue and the gray lines here. Then, then we this is our best guess right now, just uh, looking at this. And then I think uh, Barry is projecting in the Aia Halama system. So we're probably because it historically has exceeded the 4 MGD on a more regular basis during the summer and did so last year, 2021, when we had more rainfall. Uh, more rainfall than this year. And a couple is that your kind of your point you were making? That's exactly what I saw and what I was concerned about the difference in the 14 MGD over 2021 numbers, and then given the drop in the rainfall. But thank you, you articulated it a lot better than oh, me. Oh, but, oh, back to your question, Brian. So some of it is projections, some of it is current sense. Okay. Okay. But, um, the four MGD max day demand for IAEA Halaba, um, we are able to meet that demand today. Right, right now. Is that correct, but Barry? We can meet the, uh, well, it is, the demand is not four MGD right now. In the it's 3.1. It's 3.1, so we're, we're below the red line, so we're, we're okay right now. Okay. Can, I, but can if, I ask a follow up question on that? On the, so, that four, though, for Aea Halava, that does not include the 1.5 max day demand that you had on the earlier slide with the summary of the new and upcoming development projects, right? Uh, no, no. Uh, some, right, so, some, so, yeah, go ahead. No, so the four, I guess that's my other concern is the four for Aea doesn't include, Aea Halava doesn't include the 1.5 that we'll have to tack into that of the new projects in the in the chart that Barry had, or the seventy four for Honolulu doesn't include the eight point one in Q ninety five max day demand for Honolulu. That's also in the pipeline. Yeah, those are like right? future demands that are based on different timelines. So, like a zero to three year, up to three years, three to five right. years, and five years and beyond. Uh, so we right. So, we, uh, so that is a combination of like. Uh, residential type of uh, building construction, commercial, uh, high rise, uh, high density, multifamily type of construction. Uh, so we wanted to see with that other table, Joey, if you could go to that other table, please. Uh, the one with the projected, yeah, this one. We can provide more, uh, a little bit more detail uh, at the next time we present before the board, uh, next slide. But so permits under review and construction. So. Basically, permits of uh, projects that are in the building permit process right now, things that are actually being built right now, where you see the tower cranes going on, uh, and also some that already got approved construction plans. Our best estimate right now from those uh, projects, from their uh, drawings, from their plans, is a two and a half MGD million gallon a day potential demand on average. Uh, and then proposed projects three to five years. This is our best estimate based on the information we get from uh, uh, government agencies and the private sector. And maybe another 12 projects, 0.8 uh, 
Uh, proposed projects five years from way on, you know, 25 projects, 2.1 MGD. So it tells me that's probably bigger projects, higher density. And what we see is uh, companies like Kapkap will sign to really build out. Uh, we also know that transit oriented development will start. Uh, transit oriented development, from what I'm told from DPP, is it's going to occur over a long term. But there seems to be enough activity going on. Uh, right now, when we uh, we see some of those projects actually uh, coming up, uh, being proposed or thought of. Uh, so this is our best guess at, at the moment of what might be coming down the pipeline as future water demand uh, increases on these two water systems. For Aya Halawa, you can see 117 building permits uh, uh, for projects under review or construction, or have approved construction plans. Uh, so it's a smaller amount. Uh, proposed projects in the three to five year time frame, you know, 28,000 gallons more. Uh, so, but projects beyond five years, five years and beyond, you know, uh, that's about a, a million gallons a day, uh, potentially. And this is only at the current moment. Uh, we know that there is uh, projects in the Aya Halaba system because we talked to the developer, uh, the uh, old cam drive-in site, uh, the live, work, play, uh, AL or something uh, project, which is, I'm told, in, in the future is going to be like up to 1,500 units um, of housing. Uh, but this is our, this, we know that this, now these numbers will have to be also constantly updated as we get more information. Uh, but this is at the present moment, this is our best estimate. Okay, so to, to follow up with that though, what I also observe, just looking at this, is that the bulk of the future demand will come beyond five years. The three to five year uh, demand is, you know, it's what it is here, but the bulk of the future demand that we're concerned about is going to be the ones beyond five years. Uh, yeah, Honolulu has this chunk right now that near term, probably an additional two and a half million gallons a day on average, which will come out to over three million on the max date. But, uh, but yeah, you're right. The uh, well, Honolulu is kind of split. It's split between some of half of it right now and the other half in the, in the future. Yeah, but for the critical, the one that's in the critical. It's the near term. Yeah. Is for Aya Halawa, which is in the critical stage, or at least that we have it on, on the graph here, um, it's only half or 0 0.05 MGD for the next five years. And it's only after that, then you get that additional mm -hmm. MGD. But, right. but just, uh, just remember, it's a smaller water system. Uh, yeah. The water demand, uh, the max day is 4 million gallons a day. Uh, I think the average day is around 3.5 million gallons a day on that system currently. Um, so it is a smaller demand for less activity. So, so far, we're, we're talking about the two water systems as independent and unable to... Is it right to assume that they cannot share water? Like, uh, you... right, right now, what we're trying to do is get water to these systems, and they really can't really share water outside of the system. So we're trying to make up for what we don't have with the sh shutdown of the three wells. So what does it take to connect? I mean, I, I know it's not that simple, but just from a layperson's standpoint, what is it possible to connect Honolulu and IAEA system so that, let's say if IAEA Halawa is facing a shortage, but Honolulu still has capacity that you can take from Honolulu. Is that possible? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I would try to take from Honolulu, which is already short. Uh, I would say what we're looking at is uh, with some pro uh, pipeline projects, uh, trying to move water from Pearl City, uh, which is right next to the IA Halawa system, and bring it over uh, to the Halawa system. Then we also have a uh, New wells proposed, like one well at our IAM 497 reservoir. If that gets in, and we can, that's our number one priority of all the exploratory wells because what's the challenge of this IAM Halapa system on the IAM side? The two water sources are shut down. Now that they're coming and they're being fed from the west side by Kalanohi Street by Pearl Ridge, our Kalanohi, Kalanohi wells is now pumping water, trying to move water backwards. Uh, eastward, 
Um, okay. But we we really want to try to get a kind of a new well online on that side of the system. We can drop water on that side of the system. Okay, so we have options. I think Ray had some questions. I think we we got to constantly be yes call it to the, the projects that are potentially coming online. What that does to the system. What I don't see here though okay. is the capacity enhancements that we have been talking about. So, you know, the the, the chart about IA at, at, four, uh, at 4 million gallons per day, if a new pump is in fact completed in IA, that number is no longer four, that number goes up. Um, so I'd really like to see what repairs so, and enhancements. Solutions. And, and yeah, solutions. And I'd like to know what we can do to, to stimulate the solutions. Because I get the feeling it's not sourced as, except for the, for the potential contamination at Red Hill, it's not sourced as the issue. It's capacity, it's the ability to move, to pump, et cetera. Uh -huh. I realize that it, at the end of the day, it's a balance of both. But our bigger problem is, can we, is there a, is there capacity in the system to pump more? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it is uh, a source issue for because the well pumps be able to pump water from the underground aquifer. The the aquifer uh, can support the demand. It's just that we lost the pumping pump stations. You know that have the right. pump hardware to take water out from underground and put it in the system. Right. Well, we we are looking at options to try to move water around. But it also is a could be a kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, situation. But where we can move water, excess capacity around, we want to do that. That's a kind of the low hanging fruit on projects that maybe are easier to do on shorter time frames. Uh, the other thing too, in all of this, is, uh, like Barry always uh, says, uh, supply is not a, just an issue of more wells. It's also an issue of water conservation, greater efficiency, reducing uh, per person usage. Lower. We know compared to how uh, the Western U.S. is dealing with this, that the per person usage in the Western U.S. is actually much lower than our per person usage here in Hawaii. So I think there is room for people to use less. And by using less, you can always, and that also frees up remaining capacity to handle growth. So it's kind of a combination, I think, of two new source development system interconnections to optimize movement of water in the system and also water conservation and uh you know getting rid of uh, water uh, efficient to inefficient toilets you know replacing those now you're talking about some well new wells that you're hoping to drill yeah there's, there's one that you're especially eye out for IA. That will help IA. But you talked about it taking a seven year time frame. And I understand. Five, five to seven years. I understand that. I, I, we've drilled wells before, so we appreciate the, uh, the complexity of that. Is there anything we can do at the board level, or is there anything the county can do at the, at the larger county level, or the state can do in order to? Well, um, speed up the, the, the drilling. As, as you know, it, uh, it is the, uh, uh, we're subject to the permitting requirements like a private developer like anybody else. Sure. If there's a way to make the permitting process become more efficient, uh, that will help to shorten the time. Uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, the mayor is gracious to sign a letter on, my, on our behalf to request the uh, consideration by the governor to uh, help expedite the pro permitting process. Uh, we're still in the discussions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I should. We should probably let you folks um, finish the. Uh, Barry, you want to finish up presentation? I don't know where we oh, just, were. <laughs> so yeah, just to follow up. The so with Kali and Kalawal, our capacity will, will increase to, um, but they're fully online next year. Um, it'll be 81. And so that's, that's greater than the, the current max, max day. the historical max day. And by the way, that max day actually decreased because of conservation. So, you know, when you look at Kaka'ako, I mean, how many high rises went up, right? The demand didn't go up. In Honolulu, when you go up, 
my experience is that you use less water. So, but that remains to be seen again, but you use less water when you go up. When you go sideways, you increase. So Eva is increasing. Town is sort of like decreasing. I don't know about Ayahalava, but the 4MGD is our current capacity. We don't have wells that are currently under repair in Ayahalava. That's all we got. We have one standby and that's it. However, you talked about interconnections. We have a project that's going to construction in 23 that's going to interconnect Pro City and the uh, Pro City water system to IAL. Um, that will take approximately two years. Whether or not that provides sufficient water into that system, is, we're still looking at that. Uh, we also having projects that drop Pro City water, but we have a, a number of um, underutilized sources in Pro City. We can drop it into town with the controls, and that's the interconnective and interconnection projects that we have for 23. Design and construction is still gonna take four years, right? Two years design, two years construction, but that's simpler than drilling a well. The wells, because there's more permits, you know, 343 is, is, takes a year just to do an EA. So, you know, that, that really, you know, is slowing the process down. <clears throat> but um, thank you for your questions and, um, so that's, just that's, to, sorry, Barry. Um, that's really interesting. Um, perhaps um, next board meeting we can have more information on some of these projects that we uh, yeah, mentioned. We can uh, be glad yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and so, just just points out that um, you know we have the authority to curtail demand already in our rules and regs. We can restrict uh, water use uh, by any means or method of control. Next. Uh, some of these uh, chair, some of these projects, you know, are, are actually a number of them are going to be proposed in the FY23 budget too, but we can give you a kind of a preview for that. Yes, yes, that would be exciting. That are related to addressing the Red Hip situation. Yeah, that would be, that would be great. I, I think today you folks covered um, Kalihi and Kal uh, Kalaval, well. Kalaval Wells, so that's, that's one, and then now there's more, so that's, That'll be great. Okay, and one of the things when we start to look at, um, you know, additional growth, um, we have to ensure that at all times we have sufficient pressure and water supply available for domestic use and fire protection and can assume new or additional service without detriment to those presently being served. So the detriment part is that when, the, when you cannot, when the demand exceeds the supply and the water levels in the reservoirs drop, there are going to be sections of the system that are going to experience low water pressure and then perhaps no water in in certain times of the days in the max day when everyone's using so conservation can can help with that but those areas we still try to define where there's there'll be in the upper elevations in the halava area system our weak weak point i think in in the honolulu system is east honolulu because that's at the tail end of the system the water has to go across it and it's used up before it gets there. So, but th this is something that we, we we cannot affect existing users um, at any time. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay, next. Next slide. So again, again, in the rules and regs, we know we have three categories. We're currently in category two, areas with limited additional water supply. There's no building moratorium, right? We haven't declared category three, um, but in areas of, in category two, we don't make advanced water commitments. We only allocate on a first come first basis, first come first serve basis at the building permit review and the construction plan review. Um, there was only one time that we went into category three and that was because of pests, when we found pesticides in the Kunia, Waipahu and Mililani wells back in the early eighties. There was a building moratorium declared by the Board of Water that affected Eva Wainai and Waipahu, those water systems. And we only allowed a single minimum size meter for existing vacant lot. And that extended approximately five years. We've done it before because, um, until we built treatment for those sources. And then there was, on top of that, there was a drought. So I um, just wanted to say that. Um, 
Okay, next slide. And this is the final slide in my presentation. So, you know, in a critical water shortage condition, the board may develop, BWS may implement development conditions to control the rate of water demand growth. And the risk of water shortages if available pumping units are insufficient to accommodate existing and or future growth. So some of the limitations that you know we come up with and is for the board to consider. Again, the first one would be to limit approvals to single minimum size water meter for existing vacant lots, what we did back in the 80s. Um, but you could also consider that for redeveloped parcels, you could limit the water demands to the existing use of what was there before or previous water allocations. So if they came in and paid facilities charges and and uh, for a certain amount of fixtures, but they haven't installed all of that or they converted to low flow, the fixture counts, um, you stay within that, you know, we would honor that. Um, or existing water meter sizes. Now they're usually higher than the existing water use because we want the meter to be able to adequately serve each parcel. Um, their water use is generally below that, but that that's one thing to also consider. Um, we could require alternative water, um, alternative onsite water supplies such as gray water reuse, stormwater catchments, AC condensate recovery, high efficiency plumbing fixtures, you know, water sense uh, labeled to stay within those limits. Another option is what's called fee fee in view, it's what Seattle does. They retrofit another building to high efficiency plumbing fixtures and in so doing obtain the fixture credits for their development so that there's no net gain in water use. In, in that way, you could still accommodate some growth with uh, retrofitting. And the possible options that the moratorium would apply to all permits across the board equally, or we could allow affordable housing projects to go forward. Um, Perhaps residential renovations, you know, they're building a second story, adding one bathroom, it's not really a whole lot of water, as long as they're not adding an additional unit. Um, no increases in meter size, um, water for DHHL projects, and they only have projects, I believe, only in Honolulu. Um, they don't have any projects in the Aya Halawa system. Um, but those um, allowances are as previously said, as long as there's no detrimental impacts to existing customers. So that's my presentation and um, there are others, but if you have any other follow-up questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you very much, um, Barry, for the report. Um, members, any, any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions for Barry. This is Na'alahu. Sure, Na'alahu. So can you leave this slide up, um, folks? I, I just have a, a couple of questions. I'm trying to figure out, like, so, right, not all locations are created equal. Not all um, requests are, are equal as well, right? We're, we're seeing, like, bundled into the, the previous slides of, you know, maybe several thousand requests. Some of those are large water users, and some of those are, are single-family homes. And just, just to be uh, correct in it, we haven't implemented any of these uh, controls yet. We're just talking about what the options may be as we gather data to get a better understanding of what the shortfall is going to be. Right. Uh, that is correct. Yeah. And so I would be really curious to like um, to some of the other board members points as well to get a better breakdown of what the the requests really are. And like how many of them are, you know, these these three quarter inch meters for single family home use versus uh you know really large scale developments and and how do we rate that um you know and and because you know obviously right there are um a number of interested parties in this conversation because of the uh, flow uh, and and rate of development on Oahu um right we've been able to um really i mean on Oahu the discussion the discussions that i've heard go by you know, are talking about how we've been able to outsource everything else but water, right? We we bring all the oil in to burn energy. We bring all the two by fours in from somewhere else to build these homes for material security. We bring 90% of the food in to uh, supply uh, the Costco for us to eat. And really the, the last limiting reactant here is water. And we have plenty of it. We just need to stick some more uh, straws in the ground um, in a safe and 
an appropriate way to get more of it uh, over time. Is is that about right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and and so I mean, you know, fully acknowledging that there's there's pressure on the system with respect to this. I I, I would also um, I would also say you know out loud for the for the purposes of this meeting that that we're not the ones that dumped several thousand gallons of JP5 into the aquifer that we did have. Right, we're responding to um, a set of threats to the aquifer that um, that we have to respond to because we saw what happened when it impacted just ninety three thousand customers and the hundreds of millions of dollars of chaos that 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 caused. And so it's a it's a careful balance that I um, I'm I'm really su supportive of with respect to the the being as as cautionary as you folks have. And so to to kind of lay out that foundation, the question that I have for Barry and the manager would be. You know, if if you could come back to us at the next meeting, I, I would really want to know like what of those near-term development pieces, both in IEA as well as in Honolulu, um, would still be possible to build under some of these some of these controls that you have laid out, and, and then really what's uh, what's at stake. I I think the the way that I'm I'm hearing it right, there's like three or four different things we can do. Right, we can conserve. And I, I, the uh, this is actually the first time I've ever heard that the the guys out west in the continental U.S. use less water than us. So I'd like to uh, I'll bug Kathleen about that to to get more information about that and kind of see what those differences are. But basically, right, we can conserve more water to allow for more water for everyone. We can drill new, new wells, and there's there's a timeline for that. We could turn halava back on, and there's a timeline and a set of conditions. Uh, for that, and we can just do better in, in interconnectivity across the board with respect to Honolulu proper, as well as some of these other um, these some of these areas that are kind of downstream of what we would normally do. Uh, yeah, that definitely. Uh, there, you know, uh, thank you, Nala. We're just kind of reminding us all that the the situation we're in was not of our own making you know, here. We're kind of having to respond to a situation that unfortunately has affected a resource. Uh, there, you know, we we can come back to the board uh, next month and uh, kind of show you, I, I guess, a uh, best estimate of what we what could continue. Um, like uh, Barry saying, uh, IAF Halava is probably the most the system that's under the greatest stress right now. That we kind of looking for that we haven't possibility of getting into some real challenges during the summer. Honolulu, if we can get uh, Kali pump station and Kalawa wells back in service, uh, that will help get us through the summer and give us some, some cushion there to accommodate uh, continued development. The one thing about uh, Kali pump stations, eight wells, but we're not going to bring, bring all eight on, on uh, for, work for the summer uh, because there are two left for the high service system that we, we don't dare try to bring that back on because if we touch those two and try to incorporate those two on the system, we got to take the whole pump station offline again. We can't afford to do that during the summer. So we're going to wait for the wet winter time to actually do that when water demand is lower. Uh, so but we're going to focus on getting the low service pumps uh, feed the Honolulu low service back in, in service to, for the summer. So these are some of the challenges and these projects, you know, uh, were uh, underway before the crisis last year, but we're having to deal with the situation now. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I guess the, the question I would ask of Barry, I mean, you know, what it sounds to me like is like you're, you're trying to forecast and look into your crystal ball of what might be possible into the summer and, and to take these, these kind of... Um, really precarious situations and not get to a place where you cannot meet the demand of what has already been promised to customers, right? And I guess um, what I'd like to see overlaid with that as well would be just the, the timeline of the various um, fixes, right? Whether it's bringing the old wells back on or looking at the new, um, the new water that you can get in EVA, uh, or any of these things and overlay that over tea time to give us an understanding of how that pressure might be relieved past this summer so that we can be as accurate as possible when different stakeholders come in and say, hey, can I get my, my water permit approved or not? 
and you know to be to be as honest as we can with them about what the constraints are but also as realistic as possible because we do have a commitment that we've made to existing rate payers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, very, I mean, I appreciate the, your clarity. Yeah, the, 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 um, what I'm curious about is that I like to go through this summer to see how much can actually be achieved through conservation. Because without conservation, we saw demand in Ayahalaba exceed 4 million. Can we go through this summer and you know not you know and not exceed that you know with the um, you know more education more more attentiveness uh, working to the 200 highest water users in that system let's see what can be achieved um, and you know knowing that there is going to be you know we already approved a number of projects in that system and we'll provide you the breakdown um, and see where we're at. And if if we start to get a lot of uh, occurrences where it exceeds, then then we need to be progressive. Um, we have the tools. Which tool do you use? And right. you know, allow us to see how effective the current tools are, uh, and and go from there. So it, it's sort of a phased approach into it. Um, is is one way that you could. Uh, and I think it's still precautionary as well. Um, so, yeah. And just just the last thing is a huge appreciation for all you guys, as well as all the staff, in in trying to figure this out. We know that it is not easy, and uh, you're working up against many many variables trying to trying to figure it out. So, just deep appreciation from the board. Thank you. And it all goes to the actual pump operations. That's the guys that meeting that I'm just calculating. But they're the ones that are meeting it. So yeah, thank you for that. All right. I think Ray has his hand up and then Kapoor um will be next and then whoever is next. Barry, if one more filter on top of what Nahalito is talking about is some handle for us to understand priorities. Um which which of, of the litany of potential solutions um or or ideas around reducing um, pumpage, et cetera, are either most important or highest risk or something. Give us an order of magnitude. No, it's not an order of magnitude. Just an order of priorities. What's, what's really most important that we stay focused on, especially as we are in the middle of the strategic planning work. Um, there, there's just so much work you guys have to do and we have to be able to. We need to stay focused on some things. And I'd like get a perspective from you and the work that you're doing as to which of the solutions, quote unquote, are of highest priority. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, number one to me, and you know, Ernie, you know, he's way in, but um, you know, we need to ensure the resource is protected, right? And it, it, we cannot be overdrawing and you know, breaking the freshwater lens by overpumping. That's not going to happen in Aya Halava because we don't have the pumping units there. Um, and then there's no detriment to the existing customers. And to, ex to an extent, they have the control over that by conserving. And so do they have the tools to conserve? Do they, they you know, are their behaviors being uh, uh, affected? You know, are we making a difference in our messaging uh, to them? Um, and then when you start to talk about new new developments, you know we certainly have this housing crisis. Affordable housing is a crisis. So how much can we, you know, is a system able to support that? Um, and like I would I would tend to focus on the large rather than the small, um, because the small really again if you have your own restroom on a you know another bathroom upstairs. It's not that big a deal in terms of water use because you see the variation in water use in a toilet that uses 20 gallons a day, you know, it's not gonna make that much difference, it's collective. But we're working with the larger developers, applying some of these um, potential strategies on on-site reuse. For instance, like <clears throat> when talking to, you know, the uh, developer in, in the area to extend our 
uh, Palo Alto non potable system mm -hmm. to the to the site. Use that for toilet flushing. The gray water reuse too for for on site irrigation, rather okay. than that kind of stuff. So if they, if they can Barry, if they can retrofit, then Barry, you can get the water footprint down. So yeah, uh, Barry, Barry, I think our point is. But raise inventory is a priority list of projects. Yeah, when when you address uh, not only who's yeah, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get that for you. Um, uh, Kapoor, you had a question. Yes. Um. So Ray asked for priorities for solutions, and I'd like to add an ask to what Naalehu and Ray have already asked for. So you mentioned Barry a phased approach to conservation, and what I would like at our next meeting, please, is you know your list of the low hanging fruit with respect to conservation, whether that's voluntary or mandatory. You already talked about working with the top, you know, water users in the area. So I'd like to see that for Honolulu and for Aea Halava, because here in Hawaii, we've had the great luxury of having, you know, clean and abundant freshwater resources and groundwater in particular. So given that abundance, we use ground drinking water for non-potable and other uses. But now is the time for innovation, kind of exactly as you were mentioning. And so if we are looking at cutbacks, you know, what are the things that we can do for conservation um, that would make that would make a difference? We irrigate the sides of roadways. We irrigate, you know, our parks. Lots of things that if we're we're having to make decisions like do these affordable units get built or do we have brown as opposed to green sideway, you know, sides of the roads? Those are the kind of things that I think would be helpful for us in making those decisions. So. So sorry to add more to all of your work. Um, and I do just want to add also my thanks for not just you and Ernie, but everybody who's been kind of forced into this situation, but it has been working incredibly hard to get us to where we need to be. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you, Kapoor. Yeah. Members, any other questions? Uh, Chair, uh, yeah, I totally agree with uh, what Nalehu and Ray and Said. I, mean, I think there's a benefit to putting a weight, uh, which one is the top priority rather than uh, treat them all as the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are selfish by nature and their first thoughts is in any situation, you know, revolve around their own uh, interests. You know, how will this affect them? Uh, how will it help them? So, you know, what are we doing to, you know, make up the shortfall? Uh, and I think an, est uh, an estimate of the timeline, uh, and which you think we can implement, I think is is very important. And you know, how can we improve the the development of new projects? I mean, you know, what department or agency is the stumbling block to obtain you know the permits? And you know, and can you tell us which uh, you know departments you know you've been working with to make sure that everybody is on the same page? If I could just add, uh, Mr. Chair, to what Jade is talking about, I, I think also to, and, um, you, you know, if, um, Ernie, if you want to answer the, the this question, great, or my statement anyway, but I, I think what, what we're saying here is that there is not a blanket no to all development requests. It's that we're in just the beginning stages of understanding what the world is like without a lava shaft online and understanding that is going to take a little bit of time because we never estimated that we would lose this major uh, set of sites. I mean, it, it's been on since the forties consistently uh, all these yeah. decades and that, you know, when, when all the data that you've been sharing, Barry, we're looking at several years worth of data and here we are five months into this new reality and we need a little bit of time to figure it out. It, it may also point us in the direction of needing different data from DPP and from the people who want to build and get new access to new water because to Jade's good point, people are selfish and they're, they're also many times lazy and that we're going to need probably more information and, and a better set of estimates to make the good decisions that we need to make while we're on the watch with respect to this precious resource. And that's going to take a little bit of time to figure out. Yeah, uh, not I, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's hard to believe that we're only like five months into this. And it feels like this is a completely different world than it was six months ago. 
That's a good segue into the conservation uh, presentation because um, Kathleen is going to go into a number of uh, the programs and the messaging we've been working on uh, to try to achieve that. So, if they're uh, any. before we go there, yeah, before we go to the um, before we go to the conservation presentation, I think um, Ray has a question for a question. Um, what will it take for us to be able to utilize Halago again? Okay, so the uh, my short answer up to that is uh, I have to be really sure that if I turn it on that I won't inadvertently pump field tainted water into like the Honolulu water system. Uh, but to know that we have to be having a really good understanding of what's happening underground in the aquifer, the nature and extent of field contamination that may be as moving from one side of the valley to the other side of the valley. Uh, the other thing, too, is you know, we are doing a treatment study to see if that's a viable option in Hamawasha, too, and what it would cost and the timeline to, to build it. I mean, if we had to treat the water. If we have to treat the water. Okay, but absent treating the water, which is like desalting water, seawater, absent of treating the water, what will it take for us, for you to have some comfort uh, that those pumps can be turned on? I, I, uh, it, right now, based on the current state of information, I cannot turn them on. I cannot risk that. There needs to be a lot more thorough investigation into the, the nature and extent of the contamination that's emanating from Red Hill. So the Navy's already, and Erin will go over that, the EPA is, and DOH is asking the Navy to drill more monitor test wells and to redo their computer hydraulic mo uh, uh, groundwater, okay. numerical groundwater models. Okay. So, I, I, so all that analysis weighs into it. So the, the, but it's so being done. I mean, it's, it, being... it's, uh, it's in the early discussion stages. It may take a few years for that to be completed, too. Okay. okay. Um, I have a, just a couple of questions, just, just to clarify the, um, you know, Barry's presentation. Um, first is um, the wells currently under maintenance, uh, Kalihi Pump Station and Kalawa Wells. Um, how much capacity would this, and, and I understand, thank you very much for that, the timeline. I know it's a rough timeline and certainly there's no commitment to the June 2022 date. Well, there, but, there is. There is a well. We, well, we we're in this race to get these wells, yeah. at least some of the wells, back in service before we hit the peak of summer. Oh, so it's likely. So the uh, June twenty June deadline is really the target we have in front of us right now for okay. Kalihi to get at least. Uh, I think the uh, three low service pumps back in service. Yeah. And how much water are we talking about? Uh, one, the largest pump at Kali Pump Station, I think it's uh, very, was it 3,500 gallons a minute? Seven, um, yeah. The, the seven, permitted use for seven, Kali is seven, seven MGDs. So we can add seven once we turn on by June, the low service pumps. Yeah, so at least into the low service. The high and service, Kalawa, we're going to have to wait for winter. Kalawa is uh, three wells out of service. We're trying to get two back in, so let's go ahead. They're now. pumping five. We can pump up to, um, I think the permitted use is 11. Okay, so approximately seven MGD for Kalihi and maybe between maybe six. five, six for Kalawa. Five to six, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I have to look it up, but uh, it's in that range. Yeah, I think we're only Kalawa. pumping five at Kalawa. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So that'll give us enough cushion or re, uh, spare capacity to weather, hopefully weather the summer. Oh, okay. But, right. you know, we will see what the summer looks like and the peak demand turns out to be. So that what's also being tested here is how effective our, our request for conservation is going to turn out to be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I guess... Um, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, like, for example, there's a building moratorium controls draft. All we're seeing at this time is that it's a possibility in the worst case scenario, yeah. things that we can consider. 
Um, it's, uh, it's not even on the table yet. What we're focused on right now is the voluntary conservation. That, that is correct. Uh, what, what Barry's laid out here is kind of the progression in steps as we move from normal to alert to critical conditions uh, and the, the, the reasoning behind it. Yeah. Uh, and so it is kind of the preview of what could happen if we had to go there. And this is what it might look like. Okay. But it doesn't mean that we're there yet. Okay, good. So, and if in the worst case scenario, we have to kind of go there, we would have to come back, the procedure would be coming back to this board, this body, um, getting input from the community um, and making decisions as to the different tools that we have to bring uh, the usage within our capacity. Right. So we would have to uh, be able to uh, provide you with enough information so you can make an informed decision. The decision on mandatory conservation restrictions is going to be with the board. And also, if we had to go down the road of uh, a moratorium on new water meter issues, you know, those terms and conditions will be the decision on the board. And we want to have a, a public process there for our community and stakeholders to weigh in. Okay. The board makes a decision. Sure, sure. Okay, with that then, if there's no other further questions for Barry, um, we can move on I to... A, uh, I have a question, Brian, I'm sorry. Oh, um, go ahead. I and, just, then, and then I think um, Don has a question too. Okay. I Just really quick, I just want to clarify. So what we're talking about here and what Barry and Ernie have shared are the build a moratorium controls and the water shortage plans according to the Board of Water Supplies administrative rules. I wanna be really clear that the Water Code and the Water Commission also have a separate um, mechanism to declare a water shortage. So separate from the Board of Water Supply, the Water Commission could independently declare a water shortage and institute its own water shortage plans for the areas at issue. So um, there is a separate process that we could also be subject to um, that we wouldn't have. I mean, I guess we would have some input in, but we wouldn't have the last say. The Water Commission would make that call. Uh, especially when it comes to the how much we pump out of the resources, um, the groundwater resources, which are part of a water management area for most of the sun. Uh, Don, you had a question? Yeah. Um, right. do, we, do we ever consider, like, are we thinking about GACs being installed at the affected? Uh, that's the uh, that's the treatment study. Okay, gotcha. if you look at that, the the Navy did a treatment study uh, for Red Hill Shaft back in 2010. Uh, in that study, they identified activated carbon filtration and also air stripping, so blowing air through the water to try to volatilize some of the fuel. Right. Uh, and that was for Red Hill Shaft. I think at around five million gallons a day. A lot of the shaft is. Bigger. Yeah. And then I have one last um, point, if I may. Um, you know, the developers, certain developers have been reaching out to us on how they can you know, cut their water, their proposed water demand down, a number of them. And I think Ernie, you know, that they've been yeah. asking yeah. for meetings and, and trying to yeah. work stuff out. So, yeah, well, we're, we're uh, it's encouraging. We're, um, I welcome the conversation and dialogue with the development community and large landowners uh, because it, it's important that they are kept informed about the situation as it unfolds, you know, what's happening with the water system, and also talk about solutions. Uh, you know, I just want to say that uh, one, one developer approached us uh, with their idea of developing more units on an existing uh, housing project, uh, increasing the number of units. Uh, in that project, but actually using significantly less water than they currently use. So through greater efficiency you know, water conservation, uh, they think they can actually have more units built uh, greater than the number that already exists, but actually use less water. So we really welcome and applaud that kind of uh, thinking. And that's what we we're looking for with the development community uh, here. So. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're going to continue that dialogue uh, with them. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's see. Conservation 
Uh, yes, uh, next is uh, Kathleen Elliott Mahinui to give you an update on our conservation and communication efforts related to the Red Hills situation. Kathleen. Thank you, manager, board members, board chair. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please, Joy. Okay, um, a lot of what we have done for about the last 20 plus years has been based on this bedrock of seven tips to conserve. Back in 2004, we went out with focus groups to the community and said, what would it take for you to conserve about 10%? And at that point in time, conservation had stalled. It wasn't, we didn't see a whole lot of movement and we wanted to uh, re-energize that, restart it, get it moving again. And these focus groups, as I recall, I think we did about four or five of them. Uh, they said, just tell us what we need to do. Tell us what we can do. We don't really want to think about it. We just want to help you guys out. Just give us what the top seven things are. And out of that, this list came. And that's been a lot of what we've done over the years. And it's been very effective. People like it. And when we go out and do events and things like that, they're always parodying them back. And as you saw when we did our customer satisfaction survey for you earlier, uh, you did see that in the messaging unsolicited, they actually gave us back all of these seven tips, even though they claim they never saw anything from us. They still gave it all back to us. Uh, but that's uh, typical. People don't want to uh, claim they're influenced by uh, marketing messages. Next slide, please. Since November, when this crisis occurred with the uh, uh, 19,000 gallons of um, leakage into our water aquifer, we started actually soft conservation messaging. We knew this was going to come, that we would reach a point where we had to be probably more aggressive than we've been in the past. Normally, our conservation messaging does not start until uh, mid to mid-summer, mid to late summer, usually right around our plant sale. We knew in conversations with Ernie and Irwin and Barry that probably was not going to be the case here, especially once we took those three water sources offline. We had to start asking people now to start conserving or start thinking about these behaviors and start looking at what they could do. And unfortunately, at the same time, we entered a very dry winter season. Um, we, ex we were hoping for a lot of rain. December, we got it, and since then, not much of anything else. One of the other things we knew we needed to do is we needed to go out and start talking to people and, and talking to them about what was going on. Part of this was people were coming to us and asking us for information, and so we shared what we knew. And then slight, over time, that has morphed into this more conservation-focused messaging. Since December, we have had 181 meetings with people, both community groups and a number of agencies, as you can see here, both city, state, uh, board member Bukai, thank you. He was kind enough to pull together his team for us. We really appreciate that. Um, and as shopping centers, hospitals, um, as uh, Barry and Ernie have mentioned, direct, uh, developers, and they have uh, the response we have gotten has been very positive. People understand the need for conservation and they're asking us, what can we do? And as Barry mentioned, people are coming back to us and say, we want to sit down with you and talk to you about some of these initiatives. His team, uh, which my team works very closely with, are working with our contractor Honeywell on developing a number of rebates and uh, looking at other rebates, uh, commercial rebates and things like that. Which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. And again, please, anytime you have questions, just please jump in. Uh, one of the things we did start was called YYE Newsletter, and mahalo to uh, board member Anthony for his manao in helping us develop this. This is kind of an update we send out about every two weeks to people who sign up. And I hope all the board members have signed up for this or will sign up for this. Uh, just what we're doing, what's happening, uh, things that we're talking about, uh, just to keep people informed as to what steps we're taking. People are looking to the border water supply for information, for leadership in this area, for ideas and solutions. Uh, as you can see from the previous presentation, we are actively working on a number of those things. We're also doing to promote this newsletter, and it just started a, a few weeks ago. 
And so we've got a big push on. We're now doing some social media, but we have a little banner on Civil Beat that comes up every couple of weeks. Uh, Papua has seen it, I think. You, uh, and then we have a flyer that we've been handing out and that will be now that neighborhood boards seem to be coming back online, um, not online virtually, but physically, uh, we're going to be making sure these flyers get out to all the board members, even though we've emailed it to them. We also know having them at boards meetings where people can physically pick up the flyer and then the audience as well, because they, they don't always get this information. Next slide, please. We started a new public service announcements with Ernie, and I don't know, Joy, if you can click on this and we can see it. We're in a crisis uh, situation. There we go. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, let's go. Keep it short. Okay, that's okay. Fine. I know how <laughs> Ernie feels. But we have, we're getting positive feedback on it. We wanted to start with a, we need your help. You know, very positive in the sense we're all in this together. I think you've probably have seen it. We're both doing TV and radio on this. And the good thing we get is because we are a, um, a utility and an agency providing for the public good, we are able to do matches on our buys. So we'll buy, say, 25 spots and they'll give us another 25. So we're able to like double our uh, reach and frequency, which is really, really great. So we're starting with this one, which features Ernie, and uh, there's a whole, there's five of them, and they have various slightly different tones in the messaging, also talking about ways you can conserve water. The other thing we are doing is we have reached out, and through Barry's work with the Fresh Water Council, uh, they, with their marketing company, have come up with some um, messaging. Now, theirs, of course, it was is look more of a statewide, but it has enough uh, legs for us, and we will be coming back to the board to present all of this information. Uh, we just saw it last week. We just presented it to Ernie this morning, and now we have to go back, and Barry has some things uh, to discuss with the Freshwater Council, but that's going to be another way we're going to reach out to not just the residents, but to the visitors and, and uh, working with this other company on getting the message out to visitors and then the, through the visitors to the residents. It has a lot of legs in our, um, our um, uh, viewpoint because one thing we know, you can't keep saying the same thing over and over in the same way. You have to mix it up. You have to mix up the visuals. You have to mix up the messaging. You have to keep it fresh so people keep hearing it. Otherwise, they start tuning you out and they don't hear you anymore. So uh, then the third thing is we had a meeting with HECO last week, and uh, they're going to also be doing a conservation with that nexus between energy and water. And we're going to be working with them as well on that kind of a campaign. So we hope through all these different efforts, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. We've got a whole lot more we're doing. Um, we, we'll be out there. We'll be out there with different messaging, with different partners, with different groups, and keeping it fresh, keeping it visually interesting. Uh, the the uh, Especially the one that we're looking at with the Fresh Water Council has a lot of what we call disruptive type of elements to it that we think will be intrusive in a very positive way to get that message out there about water conservation. Uh, next slide, please. We're in a crisis situation. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry, this one didn't come out quite as well. Uh, we also are doing something Water Wisdom Wednesdays, and I wanna thank our board chair, board member Alehu Anthony and Co Vice Chair Kapua Sprout, we're part of, well, now, Lehu, we haven't gotten you yet. We have to still nail you down. But Kapua mm -hmm. uh, did hers, I think, last week, and the chair did his a couple weeks ago. And so you will be seeing these on uh, Hawaii News Now. Every Wednesdays, these will air. And they're just a little snippet, of, about a two-minute snippet, about something about water. We did a uh, Sierra Club. Um, we're going to have other people. We're going to be reaching out to come on a Beamer. Uh, we have a whole host of people we want to be talking about this, including people within our own agency, just different aspects, not always necessarily just focused in on conservation, but just talking about the importance of water to our community, to our islands, to our culture, to all of those things that make it important uh, and just kind of keep people educated and interested in what we're doing. Uh, we've also reached out to KHON to do a kind of a pumpage update, a weekly, how are we doing on conservation? 
And so uh, right now they're negotiating that, uh, and we hope to make that part of the weather report uh, where uh, uh, I can't remember his name, forget Justin he says, and this week our pumpage was up or down. Come on, guys, we're all in this together. Kind of a, a good positive message to say how we're doing this week in terms of water conservation. So we hope it, that will come online fairly soon. On, and so these, again, are just some of the things that we're doing. Next slide, please. Uh, we uh, updated our website. We have a new uh, page where all these things are, you can find all of this information, the pumpage charts you can see right there. We have all of our weekly tests that Irwin's team has been working so hard doing. We've been, every test that's been taken since December is up on this website. So if people want to check, what our wells look like, they can easily access, the, and it's the full test. It's not just some spreadsheet summary. So all the data is there, and we've gotten good feedback from people who actually will access it and then call us up, and in, including the media. The media is actually using this site as well for information. So again, we have tips, frequently asked questions. We have our little water wisdom segments there. We're putting up our, our TV spots. And it's under the moniker of protectoahuwater.org. So it's got its own separate URL. But if you go to our homepage website where our Red Hill button is there, it will take you to this website as well. But it was kind of a one-stop shop for all of this information that people have been asking us for. Next slide, please. Social media, again, we're out with the weekly pumpage charts. We either say it's up or it's down, uh, but just to kind of remind people kind of that visual, hey, we are we got to all start conserving and then asking people to go and, and take a look at conservation tips. Next slide. More social media, just tips based on the tips, things that we're doing. We did a number for Detect a Leak Week as well, and then we're doing like a Tuesday tip, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Next slide, please. And again, uh, the pumps, the charts were out there with that. And again, on our website. Next slide, please. Visitor industry. We had a very positive meeting with a, a hotel chain, and in fact, we are setting up a meeting to do audits with their with their with their restaurants, as well as their facilities. Uh, some of the commercial rebates that we have now are for dishwashers and ice making machines. Two areas in a hotel use a lot of water. And so uh, we're working with them to uh, go through their facilities. We're going to start with one hotel and then we'll expand as we go through it. And uh, they're very excited and we'll be adding other layers to this program as we move forward. I am so sorry, but I have to stop for just one quick second. I apologize. <laughs> oh, yeah, I run over there and give us some water. <laughs> she, she has water. I suffer from allergies, and when I talk a lot, I get post nasal drip. Don't ask me why. I know too much information. <laughs> uh, so, we're very excited with the hotel industry. The other thing we will be doing, and we've already reached out, is to the Hawaii Restaurant Association. I had the uh, Good luck to meet Greg Maples at the restaurant show where that we attended a few weeks back, and which we did a lot of good outreach there. And Greg's very excited. If you don't know, Greg is also the head of operations at PCC and wants us to come out and meet with them out of the out there as well and look at their facilities and see what we can do to help them conserve water. But I know Sherry actually wants us to do kind of a big webinar with their membership and talk about water conservation and what they can do. Uh, and we're there. So we'll be setting that up. We've met with Mufi Hanneman over at HLTA. Uh, looks like we're going to be doing some kind of uh, presentation to HTA. Uh, originally, we thought we were going to do one of their board meetings, but now they have a different idea that they actually want us to be talking to their membership or not the membership, but to members of the industry, the visitor industry, which is great. I don't have any more details than that. I just uh, heard from Carolyn Anderson just on Friday. So we'll keep you guys informed as we move forward on, on all of those initiatives. So we're very positive. We've also reached out and hope to do a presentation to the uh, 
Waikiki Improvement Association, Rick Egged, and hopefully we'll be doing that this coming month. So um, again, a lot of things out there that we're working on, and it's going to be, as Ernie says, a long-term continued effort. This is just the start. We're not stopping, and we keep asking people, if you have people we should be talking to, please let us know, because you know we don't know everybody in the world are on Oahu, uh, but we would sure like to. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, through Ernie's efforts, uh, and, and this was his idea, kind of a, um, mimicking what uh, HECO does with their little handbook that they have for emergency prep that they put out every year. We did a conservation booklet. It's available online as well as a hard copy. Well, we printed 5,000 that we'll be handing out. We were handing them out this weekend at Malker to Makai at the aquarium and at the uh, Ellison Onizuka Day of Discovery over at Ford Island this past Saturday. This next coming weekend, we're doing the BIA show, three days. And I think this will be a very popular item with the uh, audience there. But uh, thanks to Ernie's suggestion, we pulled everything that we have on our website into one little convenient booklet that people can pick up and walk out of the door with or download from the website. Uh, all sorts of information, including emergency water supplies uh, during storage and things like that. So uh, I did ask uh, Joy to hand out uh, copies to those in the boardroom and those who are not, we will make sure you get a copy of it as well. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Water Smart, we've talked about Water Smart many times to this board, uh, and we are continuing our efforts. Every chance we get, we do encourage people to sign up. It's a great way to check your water usage on a daily basis, weekly basis or monthly basis. The other thing you can do, of course, is check your bill and see if your water usage has gone up. But this also compares you with your neighbors. We don't share any proprietary information, any personal information, but just lets you know in general how you're doing with your neighbors. If you're using more water than your neighbor or less water than your neighbor. And uh, so we've been uh, pushing that uh, extensively over the last few months as well. Next slide, please. And water sensible, as I started mentioning earlier, we have these commercial rebates that uh, Barry's team has been working with on Honeywell. The commercial rebates, the dishwasher, the uh, ice maker, this is all part of what we do when we go out to a restaurant and offer. But those also are good for things like hospitals, for their cafeteria um, and, and hotels on each floor. They usually have an ice maker, things like that. So we're really starting to get that out, that word out and start pushing it with uh, the various groups that we talk about. And there is strong interest when we do meet with them, they want more information. A food service program, as I've already mentioned, we still are doing our residential rebates. A lot of interest in our rain barrel program. Uh, we've just laid in a new supply, and I do believe we're going to start doing in-person workshops coming up fairly soon. And uh, but a lot of interest. So we still got the rain barrel rebate, the water irrigation, the water weather-based irrigation water controller, and then the uh, clothes dryer. And it's all kind of under our water wisdom, you know, be wise about water. Uh, other things we've been doing is we reached out, we have a list, the top 100 condominiums in the affected areas. And between my team and Barry's team, we are reaching out to those folks and we've got like a little contest going. Whoever, which condominium association reduces water the most over the course of the year, we're going to give them a little prize. Uh, we're actually getting a lot of uh, um, positive feedback. They're calling us, asking us for information. They're calling us, asking us for dye tablets, you know, to check for leaky toilets and things like that. So it's very, very positive. Um, we are made a call, and I've been um, in conversations I've had with media. We're making the call out. We want a, a big shout out to our mayor. Um, uh, we did a little Earth Day thing with him last Friday, but he's got his people and uh, board member Don. Thank you so much. Uh, the city's been looking at their water features and turning off fountains and things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate it because it sends such a positive message. You know, we were talking about earlier about, you know, competing resources. Well, there's also competing constituencies. And that's what I see. Every day I get letters from people saying, you know, 
the, the visitor industry gets a lot of, of love, and I use that term, it's, <laughs> gets a lot of love, and so do developers. And so I get a lot of feedback from community on those two constituencies, but they're important constituencies. They're important to our economy. Uh, so how do we balance those perceptions that we're treating everybody fairly and equally, that we're not just singling out the resident? Oh, you, Mr. Resident, is very sad. You know, somebody not flushing their toilet every single day is not going to save us a ton of money. It's going to be the top 200. So, again, going back to the condos, using the condos, reaching out to them, reaching out and asking people to not keep their water features on. Uh, we were on a call with uh, Hawaii Pacific Health Hospitals, and we mentioned the water features and the um, facilities maintenance person there for Polymomi made it very clear that they had turned off their water fountain and, and we were so appreciative, you know, that they said, well, ours is off. Don't worry. We've turned off our water fountain. And as we know, Polymomi is in the Aya Halava area that's affected. Uh, we are, we sent letters out to 600 of the top water users, 200 in Aya Halava, 200 in the Metro High and 200 in the Metro Low asking them to conserve and, and work and, and watch how they use water. The good news is they're also a lot of the people we've been reaching out to and talking to one-on-one -on -one, because we find that to be very uh, positive. We've gotten, again, very positive feedback from in these conversations. We've made sure we've talked to state and uh, city agencies because, again, people, the perception is, you know, you're asking me to say, but have you talked to the city? Have you talked to the state? And we are making it very clear that, yes, we are talking to everybody. It's we're all in this together. It's not just on my back to save water. It's on all of our backs to save water. And we will continue to, you know, change up that message to reach out. But I personally believe one of the best ways we do this is that one on one contact. So we have amped up our appearances at these events. Like I said, we will be at the BIA show at the end of this month. We've got it, several disaster prep fairs coming up in May. And when you've got a chance to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, it really makes a difference. And I have to say, we're getting good feedback from people and we just have to keep it up and just be as assertive as we possibly can be in this effort. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is the last one. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Members, any questions? Uh, yeah, Kathleen is Max Sword. Have you uh, spoken to the Hawaii Hotel Alliance? Oh, no, Jerry Gibson. No, that's a good one. I'll uh, put him on my list. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you need his numbers, just uh, oh, I've got email Jerry's me. Number. Yeah, I've got oh, his number. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Members, any other questions? Just a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. I, I'm beginning to see the, the border water ads uh, all over the digital media space. So good job, Kathleen. Thank you. Yeah, and we're working on our social media toolkit. We haven't forgotten. <laughs> we'll get that up and running pretty quick. I have a question. Yes. Um, Kathleen, on a, I know on a regular basis you, um, you survey the public's um, opinion of, of, I don't know if it's the work we do, but certainly their attitudes on water and, and on water service. Um, do you, do, are you still doing that on, a, on an annual basis or whatever? Yes, we actually do that every two years. Every two years. And so we just did it in 2021 and we presented the results to you. Uh, uh, right. we, we haven't scheduled anything for this year at this time. Okay, but but you do have then then you have numbers that we can use as a baseline before all of this work took place. Correct, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. So I, I um, first was um, I think Kathleen, you mentioned feedback from developers and the visitor industry. Can you elaborate? Uh, no, the feedback has been very positive. They understand. Uh, I mean, Barry, you know, Barry and Ernie did pretty much the same presentation you saw today, and we just lay out the story. 
and they understand and they, <clears throat> the feedback we've been getting has been positive and, and they ask, what can we do to help? What do we need to do? And let's keep in touch. And uh, Ernie, was there anything you'd like to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we continue to have a discussion with them. And uh, uh, what, I, what I would like to establish actually is kind of a, a kind of a like a stakeholder stakeholder group or working group of the development community, large landowners, to continue this ongoing dialogue so we can keep them informed about what's the status and what's happening, and also solicit ideas and thoughts uh, how they can actually, you know. So it's actually, we have our regular stakeholder advisory group. So some of the members in that group, we're gonna to invite to also this, um, this special developer uh, landowner group uh, to continue that ongoing dialogue. And I think it's going to be very valuable. Oh, I think it's um, a great idea. Yeah, so they they actually, uh, one of them uh, who's a member of our, our group, uh, our stakeholder advisory group, actually made that suggestion. I thought, oh, great. You know, can you reach out to the people you're talking to, see if there's interest in that? Uh, and let's sit down. In fact, we actually have the Land Use Research Foundation uh, coming in um, next week to talk to us and uh, I want to in actually invite them also to be part of the school. Okay. Okay, good. Um, that's, that sounds like a, would be a great idea. There's an organization called Lambda Alpha, which is, uh, which are land economics of people. And they, they made up mostly, they have like 200 people, <coughs> made up mostly of uh, big landowners and developers and people who are in the in that community, you you might turn to look at them. Too. Oh yeah, um, Ray, if you can give me their contact. Sure. Uh, you know, I I, I think uh, things like uh, Lur Naya also uh, being represented in this group are, and there's also this uh, the state has a TOD council too. You know, and uh, but yeah. Please, if any other board members have any suggestions of who we should reach out to, uh, we appreciate that. The, the other uh, question I have is, you know, I, I, I love the conservation, um, you know, <laughs> emphasis to it. And I think we should continue to do that. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for heading, um, heading that up. Uh, you're doing a wonderful job. Um, I'm wondering, though, um, is it possible for us to incorporate into our message, you know, it's just some of the things that we're doing to ensure, um, you know, you know what, what we're doing on our part uh, as a department to ensure um, as much as possible the availability of water. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about that. Um, you know, I'm. Let's figure out how to do that. You know, I, I don't can't think of anything off the top of my head, but uh, let's think about that and, and figure it out. I know um, I just did an interview with Christina Jedra before this meeting and really emphasized all of those, a number of the points that we talked about today of the things in the outreach that we're doing, because I agree with you. It's extremely important that people realize that we are at being very active. I think as we get closer to some of the information that Barry and uh, Ernie are working on, there may be a great opportunity for us to go back to the media with a presentation, either a press conference or one-on-one -on -one with the advertiser. Um, those are very effective. We find, you know, those one-on-one -on -one longer form conversations. Christina has been great. Um, in, in getting the message out there for us. So I agree with you. There's opportunities, and whether it's in a paid format or what we call the unearned media, the uh, PR side of it, uh, we should take a look and see what all that is and what we can do and how to craft it into a way that people get it and understand it. So definitely we should look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, because there's um, the conservation side, uh, which is extremely important, but at the same time, we here at the department, Ernie and his team is, are working really hard to try to find different ways, whether it be new wells or bringing mm -hmm. um, um, 
you know, wells that are offline back online and different projects to improve interconnectivity. Um, just from a long term, for a long term perspective, ensuring that we do have capacity to support, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years if, you know, right. support the demand that may um, come about. Absolutely, Chair. And and we have to look at the different media and and how best to do that, too. So I completely agree with you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any uh, questions, members? If not, um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I guess that concludes the first informational item. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, Erwin. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We, I, I, my apologies, Erwin. We actually are not done yet because now Erwin's going to give us an update on the uh, corporate investigation and also the proposed monitor wells. Thank you, Erwin. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no problem. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members. I'm going to try to be really quick on this one, provide you an update on you know, the work that uh, the Navy regulatory agencies are doing to understand the extent of the contamination since that event took place uh, shortly after Thanksgiving of last year. Next slide. So, uh, again, focusing on that um, and the kind of uh, discussions that's been going on and emphasis and uh, where the regulatory agencies are want to take that uh, um, discussion and work uh, done to date. And of course, give you an update on our exploratory as well as our monitoring wells, um, siting and installation plans. Next slide. So early in December, shortly after you know the uh, November event and uh, impact on the uh, Navy's water system, the Navy went ahead and began to uh, initiate some discussion with um, Navy staff, the regulatory agencies, number of stakeholders, including ourselves, on looking at um, understanding two things, uh, mitigating the impacts to the Red Hill Shaft water source and to the aquifer itself. And out of those discussions, it was very clear that there are many things, many priorities, many issues that need to be resolved and the lack of information or real data to try to help resolve them and better understand the extent of the problem. So monitoring well data, showing what has been done to date and what they're showing so far and higher levels uh, has been uh, top of mind and um, an ongoing concern. Uh, the presence of uh, petroleum and evidence in rock cores and drilling of new wells that the Navy is installing also is something that was discussed. Uh, understanding the groundwater flow model in response to earlier questions, what do we need to understand about in trying to uh, restart um, halava shaft is about understanding where that groundwater is going, where the contamination going, how fast, how much it's influenced by pumping, and of course calibrated by real information collected from the field is some of the basic information that's needed before we can um, make that choice about restoring operations of halava shaft. And of course, looking at um, how it how the contamination event also impact the Navy's Red Hill shaft water source and studies and uh, information trying to be collected to better characterize that. Next slide. So, you know, the, um, one, of the, one of the things that really is ne needed is to get more information from the subsurface, and that's done by way of uh, groundwater monitoring wells. The Water Commission recently approved the Navy's installation of several monitoring wells, next slide, that uh, focus on two basic areas. One, uh, installing these uh, small diameter boreholes near its Red Hill shaft water source to understand the extent uh, of the damage to its, its source uh, based on you know what happened when that November release occurred and how it affected the Navy's uh, Red Hill shaft. Next slide. And also monitoring wells, not only within the property of the, uh, the Red Hill uh, fuel tanks, but also across the valley towards uh, Halawa shaft. So this is a map. And really what it demonstrates is two things. Number one, it was based on feedback from all of the different you know, regulatory agencies, experts on this matter, uh, stakeholders such as ourselves. And you can see the wide variation in terms of where people think monitor wells should be installed. And what came about is the ones circled in red 
um, trying to not only understand what's happening within the property, but what's happening across the valley toward the northwest, toward Halavasha. That data currently is really lacking, and that's what uh, was deemed to be really a priority that needs to be understood. And the commission just recently approved um, the Navy moving forward with drilling those monitoring wells. Next slide, please. Uh, but as part of that, you know, it's been for the most part, since December up until the present. Progress has been slow, primarily because there are many, many issues that need to be um, addressed and really needs to be organized. And so the regulatory agencies have um, uh, is coming up with a, an action plan to try to tune up all of the direction and pace of all the studies that need to get done to try to make sure that we get to where we need to be a lot quicker. Um, Groundwater models, for example, can take two years in terms of installing monitor wells, collecting the data, developing the models, calibrating them based on data or information collected in the field. So that can be a long-term effort. And to try to um, shorten that process, we need to be very you know, uh, efficient with respect to the efforts uh, involved. And so from the board, we have been invited to participate on that committee manager and myself have been um, chosen as our representatives and we're still waiting for that first meeting to take place. Next slide, please. Uh, Erwin, with respect, yes. Erwin, who's, who's the, um, the facilitator of those meetings? I mean, who's, who calls it under whose well, auspices? Yeah, initially it was the Navy. So it was the Navy's um, uh, they have this uh, person who oversees environmental programs along with their consultants. That discussion started in uh, shortly in early December. It went through at least through April. From there, the regulatory agencies, namely Hawaii Department of Health and EPA, are um, um, kind of taking over to try to uh, tune up all of that direction uh, to kind of lead the discussion in a much more focused way. Thank you. So with respect to the exploratory wells, this is a, a map showing um, our current locations where we plan to install these um, uh, test wells or exploratory wells to try to see, uh, identify new water supplies to take the place of the capacity loss from the wells that are shut down. Um, they're all at existing board of water supply uh, reservoir sites. Each have its own challenges and unique uh, conditions. That's that we're currently working through through the permitting process. We also had a sixth location. It was in the Monolua Valley in the park, and we went and talked with uh, you know the parks department, and we've determined that a pump station there would severely affect the park. It's not only such um, its um, aesthetics, but its um, usability, and we've decided to uh, not put a station on that particular park. And we're looking at other areas within close proximity to the park, talking with different stakeholders and community members to see if there's a feasibility to try to uh, find an alternate location. Um, next slide. Uh, this one is the monitoring wells, um, all identified in red dots. Those are the one that the board is, uh, we're installing. Um, you can notice here a couple of things. Number one, if you saw in the previous slide, then most of the wells are looking that the Navy is putting in, the regulatory agencies are focused. They're really interested in the cross valley flow towards north, uh, towards Halava Shaft. And so much of the emphasis is there. But we're, from our standpoint, we're also interested in what's going towards the west. If you recall, the Navy had some particle models that kind of show contamination could move not only towards Halava Shaft, but towards the west, towards our uh, Ea Halava wells. Those are areas of interest too. And so we're taking that path to look at um, installing these uh, test wells to collect information uh, in areas beyond the facility towards the west. And so site uh, D is at the animal quarantine station, site A at Halaba District Park, and site Q, which is over to the far left of the page, is at the IA Elementary School. All of them, we've talked to the landowners, have gotten preliminary um, approval to uh, proceed with installing the uh, monitor wells there. Next slide. 
And that concludes my overview for uh, this period. Uh, happy to take any questions. Hey, Erwin, this is Naalewa. I just have one question. Sure. You know, in the, the regulatory meetings that you're talking about, is there going to be a discussion as to the, the dissemination of the existing data that um, I think it's in, it's in like a 596 page PDF? Yes. So just to get to a place where you can use that data more efficiently on the board of water supply side to get a better sense of what's going on? That is an ongoing discussion. We've had discussions, I know manager, myself, we as a group, we've had discussions with, you know, the regulatory agencies, with the Navy, urging them to put them in a form that's much more readable, <laughs> user-friendly, easier to under understand. Um, it's already challenging that the information is technical in nature. And so trying to make it so that it's... Um, Somewhat a lot simpler than just putting out a you know 500 600 page PDF um, would be much more advantageous I think for for everybody. That's true. Okay, awesome. Uh, looking forward to seeing what that, that data collection. Uh, uh, yeah, I I have gone through that uh, 600 598 pages. Um, I've identified the uh, the pages that are of interest. So we're trying to work to trying to. Um, uh, get that data extracted and chart it to see uh, um, the different um, trends that are occurring at each of the different monitoring well sites. And are you expecting to see new data updates every week based on uh, their testing procedures there? Well, you know, the, uh, this is what was disclosed, that there is regular weekly samples being collected. Um, but the recently, you know, there was uh, a, a, you know, really a big, amount of data that was collected from about, oh, around the, you know, summer of last year up until April of this year. And that all of a sudden just showed up. And so that's the other thing that we're trying to get some clarity on is that as this data or samples are collected, you know, a, a really a better process for getting all that information out. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Yes, you're welcome. Members, any questions? Uh, I think we're going to ask them, Yeah, I do, but I, I feel like I'm asking too many. But anyway, Erin, um, I want to go back to the question I asked uh, Ernie, which is what, what will get us to the point where he says, okay, we can reopen how awful share. Sure. Okay. I cannot think of anything that we're doing on drilling wells, et cetera, more important than answering that question. Um, That's correct. I would really like something from you that tells us these are the things that we have to get done. I mean, if, if it's, if it's 10 monitoring wells, if whatever it is, what, what's the list of things that, and if we're not staying focused on that list, we're wasting our time. I, I, think, well, I think we need to stay focused on, we want to reopen Halapa shaft. What's it going to take to make us comfortable to make the, the managing engineer comfortable, et cetera, that we can reopen it. And, or else all we're doing is arguing about how people are testing wells or what's the quality of the information or how much you're yeah. exchanging. That's not the focus. I think, at least for me, I feel yeah. like the focus is what's it going to take to reopen those shots? Well, your, your question and your concern is the exact same that the regulatory agencies have. And that's the reason why they're taking hold of um, all of this work and trying to retune everything and, uh, to make it much more um, um, explicit in terms of exactly understanding what information we need to collect, who needs to collect it, and the time frame in which to get that and then digest it and then interpret it. Right. And um, I got to tell you, it's a, it's a, it's been a challenge because everybody has its own. Everybody have their own thought about what is happening in the subsurface. Sadly, though, there isn't enough information to tell us who might be close to understanding what's in the subsurface and who's not. And so. 
trying to figure out where to put, for example, the monitoring wells. The biggest challenge is, is we are working in a place that's not space friendly. It's all developed. There's either the Halava Industrial Park. It's got a, um, an active quarry there, um, you know, in that in that northwest to the, across the valley. Uh, and it also suffers from difficult terrain. All of these factors exacerbate and com complicate and really delay where we can put a monitor well. So um, that's not an answer, but as far as the regulatory agencies, they have the same question. What do we need to know to try to restore operations of Halava Shaft? And from, uh, because we don't know what's going on in the subsurface, we need to collect that information, put it in a model, and then make sure it's a calibrated model that able to reproduce what we're seeing in real life, as well as predict what we can't see underground. You know, to some extent, Erin, we've never been able to see underground. That's true. We've always and that's made, one of yeah. yeah we've that's always true. made decisions in the past. That's true. Um, so we're never going to have a hundred percent underground. But no, no. You, what you're no. saying is the bit, we need better information than we have yeah. now because we don't have the comfort. I I understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just need a path. I, I'm and, looking for a path to get and, and Ray, at the same time, because we know this is probably a multi-year effort to gather this information, to do the investigation, we're proceeding to look for new wells at the same time. Uh, because we, we have to proceed, I think, on parallel paths going forward, not put our eggs in one basket. And then yeah. two years from now, if they, they say, yes, the aquifer is carrying fuel across the valley and they validate it, that we would have wasted a two years, totally three years. years. Totally so years. we have no choice but to proceed in multiple fronts. Totally. Um, um, Kapoor has a uh, and, uh, question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erin, as always, for your um, update. I just wanted to, I remember several meetings back when I thought that you told us that you didn't think that based on the information that we have so far, for example, the free product that's been videotaped dripping from the Vedal zone into the mm -hmm. aquifer, that you thought that Halava Shaft could be safely open within the next several years. Am I mistaken? Um, no, you're correct. Um, what happens to that free product going across the valley? How does it interact going across the valley in not only the free product phase, but the dissolve? That's number one. The second one is what's in the Vedal zone? That unsaturated rock underneath the tank that serves as a source, almost like a, uh, a point source of fuel that can be released when it wants to be released, when it, when it re is released. Um, all of those things in, from, our, from my view are things that really reduce the chances of our ability to put Halava Shaft back online because we don't know when it's going to happen and how much. And my recollection was also that you had let us know that some of the experts that you've been consulting with have opined that they believe the Vedal Zone may have reached a tipping point. Yes. That over the years, based on the accumulation of the spill, we're not just looking at what happened in November of 2021. We're looking at many years sure. and many hundreds of thousands of gallons that have accumulated over time. Yes. And because of that, that is what's leading to the active dripping of the free product into the aquifer. So we're not just talking about 19,000 or so many, you know, we're looking at yes. ongoing contamination. Yeah. Um, yes, that's okay. correct. You. Yeah, you're correct. Thank and, you. And, and many are starting to believe that those two events, the November release and the one in May, are the initiating events that caused the, the Vedas zone to reach that tipping point. And now it's at that point where it cannot hold anymore and it's going to start releasing when it wants to, whenever it wants to. Great. Yes. Um, Based on your ongoing meetings with the Navy and the Department of Health and others, do you have a sense on when we'll have better information on the size and the movement of the plume? Because to me, that's going to be instructive, um, both with 
you know, especially with respect to whether we'll ever be able to safely reopen Jalapa? Uh, number one, yes. Um, our current estimate, two to three years. Okay. A model takes at least two years to build. And you right. have to drill the wells, the monitor wells, and collect the data. Right. And if you're only looking at eight monitor wells, that's a small data set in any kind of groundwater model. Right. Well, and understanding the complexity of this particular aquifer and how difficult it is to do numerical yes. 3D modeling as is, we want to make sure that we, we get it right. And, and thank you for that, Ern. I just wanted to ask for a clarification because I think as Ernie stated, we, we need to move forward on multiple fronts, but at the same time, I want to be completely open and honest with the information that we have now so that we're not holding out for something that may not be a realistic possibility. I hope that at some point in time, we will be able to reuse a halava shaft based on all the information that we've received over the past six months or so. I'm, I'm not hopeful, especially in the near future. And in the meantime, I want to make sure that we move forward with all deliberate speed, looking at whether it's treatment, new wells, demand side management, um, whatever we can to make sure that we can meet existing need and, and what's going to develop in the near future. No, thank you to, for that. Those are points well taken. I mean, um, there are many people in that uh, discussions that we're having with the Navy and the regulatory agencies. They're very hopeful, too, that the aquifer can be mitigated, that Red Hill shaft can be mitigated. But there's also some reality, and there's some reality with respect to what they're seeing in the subsurface, what they observe, actually observed underwater at railhead shaft, radio shaft. Also to um, what was happening with the monitoring wells and the data that they're collecting. Those are real information and that has to be taken into account in its, in its, in its complete form. Um, otherwise, um, you know, we're not really being really holistic about everything that we're observing. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that, Erna. Just one last question. So my understanding, too, is that we're not just looking at the spill, you know, from November or some or even what was, you know, what's the act, the free product that's actively dripping into the aquifer, you know, now. But we're concerned about the disbursement of the fuel and its distribution into the water column. And that, I think, for me, is one of the more difficult and complex issues that we're going to have to address because we can scoop up all the stuff we see floating on the top. The difficulty is what gets dissolved and moved around. That's and that's what I'm okay. Yes. Do we have any more? Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that's correct. Thanks, Erwin. Thank you. Okay. Anything uh, further? I think hearing that um thank you very much. Um uh, Erwin for the report, uh, to Kathleen and to Barry uh, for your reports, and then um, to Manager Lau for uh, putting this information together. We look forward to uh, future updates in the coming months um, to follow up on the ongoing discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, check on any testifiers in case they are waiting in the gallery or on the phone lines. Um, Madam Secretary, do you have anyone here to testify on any matter? There isn't any doctor. There was just an attendee, but no testimony for this happened. Okay, I know that um, there is no one here to testify. However, there is an attendee in yeah. person. There was an attendee earlier. Okay. All right, let's let the record so reflect. I now want to resume our normal uh, agenda items. Um, so we did take um, item number one for information out of order. Uh, let's go back to our um, items requiring board action. And item number one under uh, board action is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on March 28, 2022. I'd like to entertain a motion uh, to approve. Uh, I can I can move to uh, approve the minutes, Mr. Chair. This is Max second. Um, seconded by um, Max. Um, is there any um, addition, corrections, amendments? 
or this guy. Hearing none, um, I'd like to call for the question. Um, Madam Secretary, a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Chair. Vice Chair Coco Stroh. Aye. Board Member Ray Su. Aye. Board Member Max Sword. Aye. Board Member Naleg Anthony. Aye. Board Member Jay Butai. Aye. Board Member John Sechek. Aye. And Chair Brian Duck. Aye. Chair motion passes with seven ayes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item requiring board action is the adoption of resolution number 939-2022 to honor Mr. Kazu Hayushida and his memory and accomplishments in leadership positions at the Board of Water Supply from 1974 to the year 2000. Um, Manager Love. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I just, uh, 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 the former manager even you know, just passed away recently and uh, was actually my boss here at the Board of Water Supply when I worked here from 1980 to 1995. Kazuha uh, Yoshida was an outstanding leader. He also served uh, on the water board twice in ex officio capacities when he was the head of the Public, Public Works Department in the city. He also served on the board. And when he became the director of transportation at the state, he also was ex officio uh, member of this board and then served as a manager uh, from 1978 to 1994, about 16 years. Uh, this resolution to, to honor him, and uh, I did in, invite his son uh, to attend, but he was unable to make it. His son and daughter are both uh, unable to make it. Uh, he has actually two daughters and, and a son. Uh, Chair, would you like me to read the resolution or uh, how would you like to handle this? Uh, um, I think in the interest of, of time, time um, I have the resolution, a beautiful resolution here uh, in front of me. Um, it will be placed into the record and um, will be uh, available for um, viewing. Um, and certainly, um, you know, um, you gave a very nice um, uh, summary of um, Mr. Hayashida's career. So if it, um, unless there are uh, strong feelings otherwise, and I know we've invited um, his yeah. family and we will transmit this to his family now. I understand. If I can also you know, share that in Kazu, I view Kazu Hayashida as a mentor. Uh, he was uh, on the Perry and Price uh, showing of the water sheriff. Uh, mm -hmm. He was known for that. and. Uh, when the contamination issues broke out in central Oahu and Waipahu you know, with the pineapple, legacy pineapple uh, and sugarcane pesticides, he took that, took that on front and center and uh, was very successful in dealing with that situation. So I just want to say a big mahalo, Lu Kazu. I, I would not be in this position if it wasn't for uh, the leadership and, and mentorship that Kazu uh, uh, provided me over the years. So mahalo. Thank you, Ernie. That's a, a very um, great tribute to Mr. Hayashida. Uh, may his spirit uh, guide us uh, as we uh, face uh, our current challenges today. Um, yeah. All right, may I entertain a motion to approve a resolution 939-2022 in honor of Mr. Kai Kazu Hayashida? So moved. I second. Okay, it's been by Don, seconded by um, Ray. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, um, I'm going to call for the question. Uh, Madam uh, Secretary, um, roll call vote, please. Vice Chair Kosporo. Aye. Board Member Ray Sood. Aye. Board Member Max Sword. Aye. Board Member Nale to Anthony. Aye. Board Member Jay Butai. Aye. Board Member 
Don Sanchez. Aye. Chair Brian Antonio. Aye. Chair Morgan Patrick with seven eyes. Thank you. And for the record, um, items one and two requiring board action. There was no um, no one here or no one appeared either by phone or in person to testify. No. Thank no you. Um, moving on to item three. Uh, this is the adoption of resolution number 940-2022, authorizing the submittal of American Rescue Plan Act 2021, um, known as ARPA, State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, FRF, funding requests to the City and County of Honolulu for eligible investments in water and expenditures for infrastructure as allowable under ARPA and authorizing the manager and chief engineer of the Board of Water Supply to accept FRF funds for the designated project applications upon approval by the City and County of Honolulu. Chair recognizes um, Ms. Raylin Nakabayashi. Thank you, Chair and members. Um, Joy, if you could scroll to the resolution. So this resolution um, just uh, it reiterates, um, I won't read it, but what the American Rescue Plan Act and what fiscal recovery funds are. Um, and one of the eligible categories for expenses under ARPA and FRF is for um, eligible expenditures and in infrastructure with water being one of those. Um, and if you could keep, keep scrolling, Joy. Uh, this resolution is put before the board for action because the BWS does intend to submit a fiscal recovery fund request to the city's funding committee uh, for projects in fiscal year 23. I'm sorry, you can keep scrolling, Joy. You can keep scrolling. You know what our responsibilities are at the board and the powers of the board. So I'll just get to the end part. We do believe it is necessary and advisable and in the best interest of the BWS and its customers to obtain fiscal recovery fund funding um, to fund improvements um, to the water system. And we will be working with the city to, I guess, meet the established deadlines for the use and expenditure of the fiscal recovery funds. And should the funding <coughs> Approved, um, they shall be reflected in our future CIP budget um, as appropriations to the extramural fund. Um, and so, yes, uh, at your pleasure, we request that you um, adopt this resolution um, to allow us. And I have a quick presentation, Joy, if you want to bring that up. Next slide, please. So as you know, I mean, we've had, um, under Ernie's leadership, we've gone through many iterations of plans um, to address our very large um, water system that serves almost a million people per day. So we've had plans to invest in our infrastructure and we continue to effectuate or implement those plans. Um, next slide, please. Next one. So uh, this is just a graph. You've seen this in prior CIP presentations, just the funding levels that we project per asset category between our non-potable um, resources, treatment, facility, storage, pumps, and pipeline. So we have plans out 30 years for how much money needs to be invested in the BWS water system. Next slide, please. Um, the city council recently passed uh, or introduced by council members Elefante and Cordero was a resolution encouraging the Board of Water Supply um, in light of the Red Hill crisis to apply for these ARPA or fiscal recovery <laughs> funds. Um, that resolution passed out of committee last week and is headed to full council for adoption. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, when going over the reso, one of the eligible use categories is investments in water, sewer, and broadband. And the expenditures uh, would be for infrastructure um, and drinking water infrastructure. Specifically, we have applications in to the city or we will be asking the city for uh, $25.3 million 
in American Rescue Plan funding for these projects here, Haleiwa Wells, Wilhelmina um, 811 mm -hmm. Reservoir, Montserrat Avenue, water system improvements, um, security improvements, and control valve projects at Kaahumanu and Manana Wells. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background, Haleiwa Wells is a $6 million project. Um, next slide. This is just the location of Haleiwa Wells. Um, and it is a potable water station in the North Shore area. It was constructed in 1981 and is uh, provides water to the North Shore 225. Um, right now, um, the North Shore 225 provides a water, potable water for drinking, sanitation, and agriculture to about 15,000 people. Next slide, please. And Wailua and Haleiwa as it codes. So this is just a couple of pictures of the infrastructure out there. Next slide. The Wilhelmina 811 Reservoir is an $8.5 million uh, replacement project. Next slide. This is enough, just the location of the Wilhelmina. Um, it's located on Sierra Drive. Um, was constructed in 1931, so almost 100 years old, mm -hmm. and um, provides service to the Wilhelmina 811 and 1100 water systems. Next slide, please. These are just a couple of pictures of the reservoir as it is now. Um, it is getting close to 100 years old, so this one, this project is to actually replace and build a new reservoir. So we'll build a new one, then demolish the old when the new one comes online. Next slide. Montserrat Avenue Water System Improvements. This is a pipeline project for $4.8 million. Next slide. So in, I don't know if you can, it's a like light-ish purple on my screen. I don't know what it looks like on your screen, but um, that uh, those are the pipelines um, to be replaced. Um, there are six, 12, 16, and 30-inch water lines in that area. Um, they will be replaced with a new 24-inch um, along portions of Montserrat, Campbell Avenue, uh, Nina Avenue. Um, some of them are almost 100 years old as well. Um, and the, I guess the history of main breaks and the frequency of main breaks is causing our, us to proceed with the replacement on these water lines. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then the security improvements at various locations. This is um, one, two, three, four sites um, for a total of $4.6 million. Next slide. This is mostly to address um, chain link fencing. And this is just a couple of pictures of what happens. What we, we have a lot of chain link fencing at our over 300 or so sites. So next slide. The security improvements that we're talking about. Um, sorry, Joy, next slide. Um, or, and chain link topped with barbed wire. That's our uh, what we have in place now. Next slide. So the improvements are to um, demolish the existing chain link and replace with um, what we call expanded metal mesh fencing topped with razor wire just to harden the facilities. And then next slide. So this is Honolulu Wells. Um, it's in a pretty secluded location. So fencing, as you know, is just a, a deterrent to trespassing and it delays um, versus chain link fencing is quite easy to breach. So it doesn't provide as much of a delay to people who um, are trying to trespass or get into our facilities. Next slide. Um, Makakilo well. So this is, there's two um, locations that will be fully fenced. This site does already and continues to experience trespassing and vandalism, as you can see by those graffiti pictures of the control building. Next slide. Waipahu Wells 4 and the GAC. Um, this is so fencing all around this whole property. Um, and this site also does um, 
receive its own fair share of trespassing, and there was recently uh, property damage recorded. Next slide. So the last project that we have or are proposing in our fiscal year 23 budget to fund with ARPA or FRF monies is a Kahumanu Wells and Manana Wells control valve uh, renovations. This one is the PE or the design and engineering part of um, these projects and the request is for $1.4 million. Next slide. So these two design projects will um, be to install control valves at where I kind of, I circled with my um, red pen in <laughs> just in the snipping tool. So it's not like super fancy, but Manana Wells, which is kind of middle top of your screen and Kahumanu Man Wells, bottom right, um, to connect the system with the Metro 180, which is the blue line that's flowing through the middle of the screen. That is to provide the system interconnectivity to be able to move water uh, where it is needed. Um, so, if it so is this needed. is actually a Red Hill related kind of project to put more water into the Honolulu water system from these two wells. And I think that might be my last slide. Yeah, Joy? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Um, these, all of these projects are proposed to be funded in our fiscal year 23 budget that will be coming before you in just a matter of weeks now. We have our budget workshop on May 9th. Um, we hope that we can count on your support to submit the applications for these federal funding um, so that we can, I guess, use that to address um, so these necessary um, investments in infrastructure, and specifically these projects were chosen because they meet the ARPA and FRF funding requirements as defined by the U.S. Treasury, um, their final interim and then now final rule. And also the ARPA FRF money does have a timeline from which it needs to be used. So monies need to be encumbered by a certain date and fully expended by a certain date. All of these projects would meet those timeframes. Available for any questions if you have any. Uh, yeah, ready, Max Sword. Um, the first slide with the Haleiwa well, I don't see any secure. Well, I see a fence back there. Is, is that going to be secured also with the new funding? I believe so. I don't know if Jason or JD are on, but usually when we do station renovations like that, yes, fencing is part of the um, overall project scope. Because it looks it looks really wide open. That's, uh, I'm just looking at the pictures. I will double check. And, yeah. we'll make and sure, also with um, my with my tongue firmly in my cheek, you ever thought about electrifying the fences? Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Tongue firmly in cheek. Yeah. Uh, answer is no. <laughs> The expanded metal mesh has proven to be a, a, a much better deterrent, though, to people getting in. Chain link is easy to damage, easy to cut. Expanded metal mesh, because it's so much harder, you can't use like a bolt cutter or something. You'd have to really sit there and saw at it. Um, people usually don't attempt the kind of trespassing they do when they see expanded metal mesh. All right, members, any uh, further questions? If not, I'd like to entertain a motion uh, to approve uh, this resolution. Yeah, Max, uh, so moved. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Max and seconded by Ray. Sure. Um, is there uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, um, I'll call for the question. Um, Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Vice Chair Kapoor Pro. Aye. Board Member Ray Su. Aye. Board Member Max Sword. Aye. Board Member Donald Dixon Anthony. Aye. Board Member Jay Butai. Aye. Board Member John Sechet. Aye. Chair Brian Lanz. Aye. Aye. Chair, motion passes with seven. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ray, for the report. Uh, exciting that uh, we've got some. Um, projects uh, relating to uh, improving the interconnectivity of our uh, water systems and um, 
you know, helping us uh, deal with the, the situation we have. Yeah. And along those lines, uh, the next item uh, requiring board action is to authorize a public hearing, which, as we mentioned, is going to be in a few weeks, to consider the proposed fiscal year 2022-2023 operating and capital improvement program budget. Uh, again, Chair recognizes Ms. Raylin Nakabayashi. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. So yes, um, as was mentioned on the action for the prior reso, we do have our fiscal year 23 budget coming up. So the public hearing will be scheduled for Monday, May 23rd at 2 p.m. Um, or soon thereafter. Uh, and it will be on both our operating and capital improvement program budgets. The resolution um, is essentially a preview of what will be posted on our website and in the newspaper for the public so that they can be made aware. Uh, in the body of the letter, though, it mentions also that we have budget workshop on May 9th, I believe it is. Yeah, I can't make it. May 9th. Um, the meeting will run similar to this, where the public can testify in person, they can submit written, online, or phone testimony. Um, and the materials, of course, will be available on our website. And we will have materials for all of you board members as well. You will see I th in the, the budget that we, when we go through in workshop, um, really clearly, I think the monies that we are applying for, for the federal funding are represented as projects in our extramural funding account. Um, and then there are, so those are the projects that qualify for ARPA and FRF, but you will also see, I believe in May, the, the rest of our efforts to address Red Hill immediately. Um, we've already started spending in 22, but 23 also will, will show you the, um, some of our efforts in that area. Okay. And I don't have a PowerPoint for this one. Sorry, just the reso. Oh, this is fine. Um, uh, may I entertain a motion to approve uh, or to authorize this public hearing? Just a note, it was a, on the letter itself. It says Tuesday, May 23rd. I think it's Monday, but it's, it's right in the middle. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so noted. Um, please... Uh, Note that the board meeting will be taking place on Monday, May 23rd at 2 p.m. and not any other day. <laughs> so um, may I yes. may I um, entertain a motion to approve? Is there a motion? Sure. Um, Okay. I'm not going to be here, but <laughs> thank you. Man, All right. <laughs> but All right, second the motion, Mr. Fun. Chair. Okay, it's been moved by Ray and seconded by Max. Um, uh, clarification uh, the uh, board meeting will not be on the 30th, and it'll be on the 23rd? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, and, and it'll be Monday, the 23rd. Thank you, Don. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a slight correction to the rest. Yeah, and then I also have just just as a I'm sorry, just as a scheduling note for everyone, the budget workshop will be on May ninth. May ninth. Yeah. Okay, good. May 9th at two p.m. Yes, which is also Monday. Which is also on Monday. So, um, before we vote on this motion, uh, please uh, double check your calendars. There are going to be two meeting dates in May. Coming up next month, uh, we have May 9th at 2 p.m., which is the budget workshop. And then two weeks later on Monday, May 23rd, we will have our regular board meeting. All right, if there's no other um, comments, I'd like to call for the questions. Madam Secretary. Vice Chair Kapoos Bro. Aye. Board Member Ray Su. Aye. Board member Max Ford. Aye. Board member Nalek Anthony. Aye. Board member Jay Kutai. Aye. Board member Don Sochek. Aye. Chair Brian Nakaya. Aye. 
Chair, motion passes with seven eyes. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to or go back to items for information. We have um, we we've already um, done um, item number one, the update on Red Hill. We'll move to item number two then. Um, this is uh, the recruitment status update. Chair recognizes Ms. Michelle Thomas. Good afternoon, board chair and board members. I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, I am here to provide you with a recruitment status update for the period of January 2022 through March 2022. For the period of January 2022 through March 2022, we had eight new hires, five promotions, one demotion, three transfers, 13 separations, and one retirement. During this period, we did have quite a few um, resignations, as you can see, um, and separations. And this is mostly for the purposes of employees moving within the city, as well as within the Board of Water Supply. Um, we are seeing a lot of movement, and as such, we are moving towards trying to be as active as possible. We are working with the city uh, to on a various different pilot initiatives for recruitment. So that way we can continue to ramp up our efforts with recruitment as we do realize that there are a lot of folks who are moving within the city, within the Board of Water Supply and reevaluating their work-life circumstances as part of the great resignation, which we've been talking about for quite some time. And so we are trying to make a lot of different moves um, in our marketing as well as our recruitment efforts to try to make sure that we are doing our best in getting the best quality candidates for the positions we have at the Board of Water Supply. At this point, um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, is there any questions from you? Members, uh, any questions? I have. I have one. Um, Michelle, um, I understand the great resignation. Um, uh, as far as the, the laterals, the, the laterals to other city departments, for example, do we ever know like what, what is the reason uh, for the transfer or they're, they're wanting to transfer? So um, both, um... The manager and I offer exit interviews for folks so we can ask them those kinds of questions to see if we can assess whether there's things that we may be able to change at the Board of Water Supply to be able to encourage folks to stay with us. Um, a lot of times those changes have to deal with different opportunities for folks. Um, and, and there's also a lot of times where they don't disclose to us. But if they do disclose, we do try to manage that um, as best as we possibly can. And um, Manager Lau and I are often in discussions about what we can be doing in order to engage our employees and keep them at the Board of Water Supply. I see. Okay. Any further questions? Can you give us any insight into um, you one what why they're moving into any ideas that you guys have come up with? Uh, some of the uh, uh, movement is uh, promotional opportunities. So I, I, you can't. You can't. I I can't fault them. For yeah. That. Uh, or, you know, a personal situation that uh, a job in a different location actually works better for their family. So I respect that. Um, I, you know, I, I think we got to continue to work at it um, to see how we can retain people. Being able to offer things like the flexibility of telework, I think, is attractive to some and for some workers. And, they're looking for that flexibility. So, uh, although the COVID related telework is going to soon end at the end of this month, uh, we're looking at uh, being open to even a more permanent arrangement of uh, telework to try to retain good workers, but, but also uh, make us attractive as an employer. We're, we're flexible like that. Uh, Michelle, you want to add anything else? Sure. Um, we actually, are doing a lot of different 
discussions with our employees and our management in order to talk to them about that flexibility, um, such as also um, utilizing the city's flexible work hours um, program. So that way we can allow employees to come to work earlier or later, depending on what their certain life circumstances are that makes it easier for them to deal with their personal life situations like childcare and things like that. We are also um, working with our um, training staff uh, to develop different kinds of uh, training opportunities for employees in various different areas to try to give them a little bit broader horizons and also um, get them into places where they can continue with the board um, or at least get the opportunity to be able to learn more in their current scope of their position so that way they feel valued in the workplace. Um, and we have other different initiatives that we're looking at um, over the next, you know, fiscal year, we will be continuing to look at those innovative ideas to hopefully make sure we can get more in, um, engagement. And one of the other areas that um, Manager Lau has encouraged us to do as well is to work with the managers and supervisors to kind of get them in a better position for being able to be successful managers and supervisors so that way there isn't as much conflict or anything like that between them and their employees. So that way they feel, you know, a sense of ohana with the board, so to speak. Michelle, do we find that when we're replacing people who are leaving, that we're replacing them from within in general, or it, are we going needing to go outside for most of those replacements? So the um, practices for the board that we promote from within. So as much as possible, we do try to offer opportunities to our current employees so that way we can retain them as well as make them feel more a part of what we're doing at the Board of Water Supply. However, there are certain positions where we just can't fill within. And so in those positions, we do get go externally. And for those types of positions, when we're going externally, we do try to develop partnerships with the local schools like UH and the high schools in order for us to be able to have, you know, feeder groups to come into those positions that are a little bit more difficult to fill. Uh, so I do want to point out to you, it's not always people leaving us. We have actually people coming to us from other city agencies and government agencies. So there's just right now so many vacancies all over the place. It really, uh, employees are in a good position to kind of look at and make choices about their careers and their personal lives. Uh, we are looking uh, and have actually uh, brought in uh, more entry level, like, for example, the engineers. Uh, for the first time in like our capital projects division has actually opened and actually been very successful in finding some engineers, CE1s, uh, that really are, look, have a lot of potential. They just need time to be mentored and trained. Um, so. Finding licensed engineers is really difficult right now. Uh, but as an example, so we've gone to like, let's go entry level and raise them and grow them within the organization. I'd like to also add that, you know, we do, as you can see in the uh, second page of the report, um, the anticipated starts, we have had almost 30 anticipated restart starting individuals in the last quarter. So we are very active in hiring our uh, for those positions. It's just unfortunate that we have a lot of folks that are moving out for whatever reasons they are moving out for. So we are a an attractive employer, and it does appear that we are not having a that uh, huge issue of bringing folks in. It's just more a matter of, you know, the interplay between those folks who are leaving as well as those who are coming in. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, any any further questions? No, thank you for the report. Um, thank you. Sure. You're welcome, have a good day. All right, next up is uh, item number three, status update of ground weather levels at all index stations. Chair recognizes Mr. Barry Busagal. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. For the uh, for March, we had three uh, index stations in low ground water. Uh, Wailua's in caution, Kamaki and Punalu are in alert. 
Uh, the monthly production was 135 million gallons per day. Uh, rainfall was 46% of normal. And uh, the five month moving average is, a, is about normal. Uh, we are in a drought and we will we anticipate uh, uh, drought conditions through the summer. And um, but heads are uh, relatively high, except for um, those you know, like in Punalu and in Kaimuki. Um, and that's my report. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Members, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you for the report. Thank you, Barry. Final item for information, item number four, is the water main repair report for March 2022. Chair recognizes Mr. Jason Nikaido. Hey, good afternoon, um, Chair and Board. Uh, the following is the water main repair report for March. Um, we had 24 main breaks in March. That brings us to a total year-to-date of 293, and both of those numbers are uh, similar to previous years, um, as you can see from the graphs. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a list of the 24 main breaks we had, and as you can see, most of them were on the small um, diameter pipes. Next slide. And for leak detection, our leak detection team um, investigated uh, 30 uh, points of interest to bring us to 362 um, for the year. That is similar to last year. We, we kind of had a full year um, in terms of leaks found. They found 68 leaks um, last month, uh, which brings us to 566 leaks found to date, which is already greater than the previous year. Um, that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? If not, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nikaido, for the report. That brings us to our the end of our regular agenda. We do have a couple of items uh, in executive session. Uh, may I have a motion to um, move into executive session? So Okay, any second? Okay, there's Max second. Okay, it's uh, moved by um, Ray, seconded by Don. Yes. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed say nay. All right, um, motion carries. Uh, well, let's stand in recess. Uh, real Okay. okay, let the record reflect um, that we have quorum. Uh, we have uh, board members of uh, well, Vice Chair uh, Spro members, Utai, Anthony, and Sword um, via WebEx. And we have um, members um, Soon and Sefchek here in the boardroom uh, with myself. Uh, members who are on WebEx. Uh, for the record, I'll note that your status from, um, you know, your disclosure earlier in executive session um, is still the same. If not, please um, let us know. And hearing none, I'll call for um, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, moved um, by Ray, second by Don uh, to adjourn. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Okay, uh, motion uh, passes. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much, members. For Thanks, everybody. Day.